Hello, and welcome to the Angry Sung Zone Conglomerate. We're thrilled that you've been acquired into the company, and the first order of business is to sort out who you'll be reporting to. In other words, your boss. In this onboarding package, you'll find information on some of the best performing and most creative bosses that you will be encountering on this corporate journey. Guiding you along this process will be Synergy Manager Alex. Hello! Master of Business Sean. Hello! And me, the AI Head of Human Resources, Santo. Grab a cold drink and your favorite work from home bathrobe and enjoy the ride. That's right, today, it's all about the bosses. Big ones, small ones, some as big as your head. You'd like to surely skip them, but here we'll face them instead. And soon you'll be dead. Alright, so, uh, obviously, many games have bosses. Not all of them, but many. And yeah, today we're going to be talking about some of our favorite bosses, uh, some of the bosses we didn't like, and just some general thoughts on even like the whole idea of uh, a video game boss in general. So yeah, I mean, one of the things that, uh, that I have been thinking about is, uh, you know, questions like what actually makes a good boss, right? What makes a bad boss? And then there's, there's other things too, right? There are other questions we can ask. There is a whole world of questions which we could ask ourselves about many things, including bosses. Yeah, I don't know if we want to just jump right into some thoughts on that. Like, you know, what makes a good boss fight for you guys? Yeah, it's a great question because uh, in thinking about this topic, I... Start. I, I started from the idea of okay, what are you know some of the most memorable and some of my favorite bosses, but there's a number of bosses I think are fairly memorable, but the actual mechanics of the fight might not be the greatest, and there's plenty of bosses that whose game mechanics just kind of make them forgettable, like uh, we'll get to some game examples later, but. Yeah, so I think it's a great question to ask yourselves, whether you're a designer or a player. Yeah. Yeah, actually, you know, on that note, uh, something that came up that I noticed in a few of the entries that I, uh, that I decided to put on my list is when it comes to bosses, there's really sort of two things, I think, that make them memorable. One of them is... Like you say, it can be the mechanics of the boss fight itself. You know, a lot of bosses uh, change up the gameplay. Uh, they change up kind of the dynamic of the game, the feel of the game. Uh, it, they can be very different from regular gameplay. Uh, not always, but they can be. And that is definitely something that can be very memorable if there's a very unique gameplay section with a particular boss in a, in a game. Uh, but... The other thing that a lot of games do with their bosses is that they they may use the boss boss fights as uh, opportunities for characterization of the villain, uh, especially if it's a recurring villain which you face uh, multiple boss fights throughout the game. Um, actually, so one of one of the bosses uh, that I really love, uh, kind of for this reason, actually from uh, Super Paper Mario. Mr. L. <laughs> now, who is Mr. L? Who is, who Mr. is Mr. L? Mr. L is a mysterious villain um, that you know bears a, 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 an uncanny resemblance to a certain green-clad hero in uh, in the Mario universe, um, which is completely coincidental and definitely does not mean anything. Um, but what I really liked about and I mean, obviously, this is going to be kind of a spoiler-heavy episode. So, if you're, yeah, I've got like five final bosses on my list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If if you're worried about spoilers, I mean, we'll mention the game, and then you can just stop listening if you uh, really want to play that game. And I still recommend the podcast to your friends, and still <laughs> recommend the podcast. Yeah. yeah, this episode was so amazing; it made me go out and play the games they were talking about before finishing it. 
Oh, yeah. But anyway, Mr. L is actually Luigi in disguise uh, after being kind of mind controlled. Uh, but what I really liked about it is that, you know, they use the character of Mr. L to flesh out the characterization of Luigi as a character, as well as like playing off like characterizations of his interactions with the other uh, other villains in the game. And I just I really love that. And you get a lot of uh, the Paper Mario series in general. Uh, does does a lot with like really great uh, dialogue and I, I think that a lot of RPGs are probably like this where they they definitely use boss fights as sort of characterization of the villains uh, as, as a place to do that and uh, that can be very very memorable I mean Mr. L as like mechanically the boss fight against Mr. L is just the same sort of typical uh RPG battle gameplay ish. Well, Super Paper Mario was a bit weird, but it's pretty much the same as the rest of the game. Um, there's nothing mechanically that interesting going on, but it's just the characterization provided through the boss fights with him. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What you bring up about like, there, some of my favorite bosses are ones that recur over the course of a game and you see them yes. evolve from not only, you know, the, the boss fight itself, but the story layers but uh, as well. Um, one of the best examples that I can think of of that is Kefka from Final Fantasy VI. You fight him <coughs> three times over the course of the game, and all three of them are fairly unique circumstances. Uh, the first time you fight him is part of a weird section where you split your party up into three different teams and have to, like, position them along this wintry tundra kind of area to intercept enemies that are coming at you. And as you fight through waves and waves of enemies, you eventually get to Kefka at the bottom. Now, what's interesting about this is that because you, you're splitting up your party, you don't have enough party members to have three full teams. So if you... Maybe it's your first time through, you're probably going to split your party fairly evenly, so you might end up fighting Kefka with, uh, like, a three-person party. And if you lose one of your party, that's it's actually fine. You can go attack Kefka with your other members, too. So that's a really unique uh, situation in which you fight Kefka. And Kefka's also just hilarious. He's so fun. Just this evil, evil clown. Uh, the second time you fight him is basically... It's basically like a cutscene battle, but... In a, you know, 16-bit <laughs> RPG, uh, it, there's barely any fight to it, but it's just all story, but it's, like, told in the battle engine, which is really weird. And there's even some glitches you can do with that. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, because to make it work, they technically added Kefka to your party. Wow. Because uh, the way that they uh, use the sprites in the battle scenes is that the enemy sprites are <clears throat> fairly like they don't really animate they like flash or maybe they move forward or backwards a little bit but whereas your character in your party are fully animated you know you'll see them swing their sword you'll see them have a casting animation and whatnot so they did that for kefka to make him bounce around the screen and have a bunch of weird shit go on so that's really cool and kefka ends up being the final boss of that game <laughs> uh, after taking over uh, from the the evil emperor, and his boss fight is a four stage tower that goes yeah through four different stages of just like unique uh, bosses, and the last one's Kefka, and he's just this angelic figure, like in his own mind clearly, but also like the game portrays him as such. Like there's the background is like kind of a sunsetty, like very golden background. He's got like gigantic angel wings and a flowing robe, and the music is this operatic, majestic masterpiece. And like any Final Fantasy boss fight, he has a bunch of bullshit that he can throw at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. And and throughout the entire time, like every single time you fight him, he is like saying shit in battle that matches his character and lets you know that he is crazy and he's awesome. 
Yeah. So you, you don't, uh, you mentioned one of the things there that I think I really like in a lot of boss fights, uh, which is uh, sort of a multi-stage setup where the boss changes significantly partway through, you know, some, it could be once, twice, or even four stages <laughs> uh, or, or potentially more. I don't know, but uh, it's a really cool mechanic, I think. And definitely a lot of a lot of games, uh, you know, utilize it uh, to various extents. Whether it's just changing up the attack patterns as the boss loses health, or going through a, a completely separate uh, arena and even style of what the boss looks like and, and what the boss does. Um, and I think that, that that definitely adds a certain like done well that adds a certain weight. I, I would say uh, to the boss fight, and so I, I really, I really like it. Actually, one boss in particular that uh, was super, super fun and memorable to me uh, for a similar reason was a boss from Metroid Prime Two uh, called uh, uh, Quadraxis, <laughs> and Quadraxis in Metroid Prime Two is such a cool boss uh, because first of all, you you get into this this like this massive arena and quadraxis is huge like quadraxis is easily easily like you know 30 times your size or something ridiculous <laughs> and it's this big hulking like spider creature robot and you know at first you're at first you're kind of shooting it and uh uh, trying to take out its limbs uh, so that because that's the weak point um, and so you can kind of get it down and you know in the second stage uh, parts of it start flying around and you gotta deal with that and then in the third stage you have to like so Samus can use the morph ball and you can you have to go into the morph ball and you actually you ride up part of essentially the corpse that's already been destroyed and then you use that as a launch pad to launch onto the final flying head of the boss uh, and land on it to drop uh, bombs inside of it, which is just such a cool, it's such a cool uh, boss mechanic. And there's really, I can't think of any other, I can't think of any other boss in the Metroid Prime series that's, that's similar. Like it was such a unique, it was such a unique gameplay element that they added for Quadraxis that even now, you know, it, it came to me as like, yes, this is probably my favorite boss actually in all of the Metroid Prime series that I've played. Just because it was so cool and different. You know, getting back to that whole thing about like, you know, boss fights can be memorable kind of for the mechanics. And this one stood out as just having such interesting, fun and unique mechanics. Uh, it was also pretty. It was also a pretty tough and pretty long boss fight since it had the three stages to it, uh, and so it, it was very memorable to me. Awesome. I too uh, played Metroid Prime Two, and Quadraxis was definitely one of the most uh, memorable boss fights from uh, I would say the series. Um, not not my favorite. I've got a different one from the Metroid Prime series to talk about in, in a bit, but I agree with you that the um, interaction in that boss fight between the, uh, the, you know, the regular combat elements plus the actual using Samus's other abilities in order to ultimately be able to defeat that boss was yeah, very I, enjoyable. Because I think, yeah, you had to use the morph ball features and you also had to use some of the visors, uh, I believe, as well to kind of uh, deal with some of the things that were happening in that boss fight. So it really used all of the gameplay elements um, that you even had in the game kind of in this one boss fight, which was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing that you mentioned that I love to see in boss fights is a, a real great sense of scale. Like, that can, yeah. that can easily make a super memorable boss fight. Uh, for me, one of the best examples of that is one of the first... Uh, Legend of Zelda bosses that we'll probably be talking about today, I have to imagine, that we'll be talking about a bunch because they're great, 
is a uh, Star Lord, the boss. Star Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I literally, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I had, I was, I think Star Lord was the first Zelda boss I put down oh, on my list because yeah. it's such a fun one. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Star Lord is the boss of the desert temple kind of area in the Twilight Princess, and that temple hosts one of the most unique. Zelda uh, items that you get, which was the spinner. Yeah. So you're basically on a Beyblade, yeah. just bouncing around. You can uh, hook into parts of the wall uh, and basically grind. <laughs> yeah, uh, really, really cool, really cool item. Yeah, and the Stellar boss fight, like, really, it's all about that item. So, uh, other Zelda boss fights, like, the item in the dungeon plays a huge role in how you beat the boss, but this one is all about that spinner. Yes. And Stalord is this gigantic skeletal dragon that you fight in kind of like an antlion pit. And you don't even see the entire dragon. It's like from its rib cage up. And it's spewing like toxic mist at you. It has gigantic claws. You need to basically ride around this antlion pit and shoot yourself in towards the center and there's skeletal soldiers in the way that you'll bounce off of. So you just need to like position yourself and get a really clear shot at Stalord's spine. You do this three times because it's a Zelda boss. And yep. then Stalord falls. The, the sand fall, goes away. And you're like, all right, well, that's the boss, right? Wrong. Stalord's head reanimates and is just flying around the cylinder that you're constantly spinning up in a spiral and you need to dodge fireballs by jumping your spinner off of the cylinder you're on to the wall next to you and you're literally jumping through the air on this spinner dodging fireballs until you're able to get close enough to jump and smack it in in the face which then drops it, and then you can hack at it with your sword. It's, again, a, an amazing sense of scale that I don't think has been seen in any of the other uh, Zelda games that I've played, at least. And, as well, it's a two-part boss where uh, the mechanics are so, so fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very, very cool boss fight. And I think it also actually gets to one of the other things that a lot of boss fights do. Um, maybe even more so than uh, the game might have otherwise, which is a focus on positioning. Uh, I find a lot of boss fights tend to be really uh, uh, more focused on positioning than the game they're, they're in normally would be. And I mean, this makes sense because you think about it. Uh, often they take place in some kind of arena and uh, the bosses, a lot of bosses often telegraph their attacks with a little bit of uh, lead time so you can uh, respond and try to move out of the way. And, you know, being really aware of where you're at in relation to the boss versus the boss's move set it typically is a really large part of, of uh, beating the bosses. Bosses that you struggle to beat, usually the you know one of the problems that you're uh, maybe encountering is that you know you haven't yet figured out the the ways that you should be positioning yourself relative to the boss in order to evade attacks. Mm -hmm. And I find that definitely there are some games where that is it's definitely more even in the Zelda games. I would say positioning matters more in boss fights in the Zelda games than with regular enemies. Um, especially because a lot of regular enemies, you can kind of take them out more quickly, and there's a more limited danger zone, shall we say, with most enemies in a Zelda game. Typically, if you're not close to them, you're not in danger, outside of a couple enemies that shoot lasers and arrows and stuff. So, I actually have another uh, boss from uh, the Zelda series that I really like, and that's actually Morpheal the boss that you have are only able to access in Twilight Princess by diving down to the bottom of the lake. And for those of you with a little bit of uh, uh, um, phobia of deep water, this level is definitely way up there in the, uh, oh my god, what am I doing? 
Um, and so you go down, and once again, uh, it's another boss that has a big synergy with the um, items that you've just finished unlocking. And so um, taking that one down definitely felt like uh, n not just yet another engaging boss battle, but also a little bit of, you know, kind of fighting your fears. Because within every person w would have like a unique thing that might uh, creep them out a little bit more that actually makes certain bosses more memorable to you. So that's my I one totally advice yeah. for the audience is to think about some of the creepiest bosses or the bosses that you enjoyed the most and think about how that actually relates to, you know, you as you know yourself to be. Um, and uh, the answers might surprise you. Uh, if we want to keep on the, the Zelda train... Not Spirit Tracks, that's a different Zelda train. Uh, <laughs> but another Zelda boss that I love is uh, Phantom Ganon from Ocarina of Time. Phantom mm -hmm. Ganon's yeah. my favorite boss of that game, for sure. Uh, because, like, when you initially go into that room and the boss shows up, it just, it just looks like Ganon on a horse hovering in the air. So you're just like, oh shit, this is the first temple after you become adult Link. So you're like, oh god, am I fighting Ganon already? But then he just like kind of rips off his face and reveals his like phantom form. And that's just phantom Ganon. And you're like, oh, this is awesome. Yeah. Then he uh, rides his horse into the various paintings surrounding you and comes out of another one. So you have to, you know, be... Be mindful of the full 360 degree range around you to see where he, where he's going to pop out so you can shoot him with an arrow. After you do that a few times, he comes out, not on his horse anymore, and floats around and starts shooting magic lightning balls at you. And how to deal with these is you need to reflect them back at Phantom Ganon by hitting them with your sword. Now, I love this so much because... Yeah. This is not only a callback to A Link to the Past uh, with Aghanim, where you're doing the same thing, but it's also foreshadowing what you end up doing in the eventual final battle with Ganon, at the very, Ganondorf at the very end of the game. You do the exact same thing. You reflect his attacks back at him. So it's such a... It's like a recurring boss, but not really, because they're you know two separate entities. It's but, a it's a recurring mechanic though. Yeah, and that's that's such a great place to put it to, you know, being the first temple after your adult link and really like showing you what's to come. Yeah. One of the best examples of foreshadowing ga in games I can think of. Yeah, yeah, definitely definitely a cool idea and uh they've They've used the same. Uh, they've used the same idea in a couple of the other Ganon, Ganondorf fights in uh, mm -hmm. in 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 the various games. Uh, which I mean, I'm not gonna lie. Like at some point, you're like, okay, you know, is he ever not gonna shoot a ball that I reflect back at him? <laughs> um, but in some of the recent games, they've moved away from him as the main villain, which I think is probably a good thing. <laughs> It's only so many times that uh, we can have Ganondorf as the as the main villain before we're like, how is this still? Well, there's always a Zelda. There's always a Link. There's always a Ganon. That's just how it works. That's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. While while we're while we're on this uh, Zelda kick, uh, I'm just gonna throw out pro probably for me the most my favorite my favorite Zelda boss. Actually, um, it's just Dark Link, who mm -hmm. isn't even isn't even a full dungeon boss, um, and is still like he's a half boss kind of. It depends which version you're talking about. I'm talking. Well, I'm thinking of the Ocarina of Time one. Yeah. Um, I think he's actually the final boss of Zelda Two: The Adventures of Link. <laughs> oh, I haven't actually played that one. Uh huh. But. Yeah, Dark Link's been in a few games, but the one in, in Ocarina of Time is the one that's most memorable for me. And it's just such a cool boss fight because you get there and it's just this weird, like, it's just this weird uh, area 
where the floor is is like a reflective lake bed salt flat looking kind of actually it doesn't even really look like anything it looks like something out of the dream it like it looks like a perfectly reflective like water surface um that just stretches on as like forever that's basically the, the design of this level and then there's like a single tree in the middle and it's just such a it's such an imposing arena and so enigmatic and also it just kind of comes out of nowhere and isn't really explained like dark link is just there you know and it's such a hard bot it's such a hard fight because he copies your moves yeah <laughs> and i've always sort of uh found that that fight in particular is actually one of the hardest i swear in that game i i don't know maybe i'm just bad at the strategy to take him down <laughs> uh but i always i i like i i replayed ocarina of time recently and although i found going back to it after playing you know many more other zelda games and just generally uh being a bit better at video games these days than when i first played ocarina of time i found a lot of the bosses fairly easy but not but not dark link i died to him like three times you're so, you're so good that, you know, if it's a reflection of yourself, of course it's going to be difficult. Yeah, yeah. And I, I really like that, uh, like, the mirror match aspect to it is a really, uh, it's a really fun kind of uh, challenge to throw into the game. Yeah. And yeah, Dar and, and Dark Link is really just never fully explained. I, I think there's some, there's some dialogue about how it's like, you know, you need to you you must overcome yourself or something like that and it's just sort of left up to the up to the player to kind of interpret what this boss is even about um and it's left kind of mysterious and open which i think makes the boss all that much more memorable it's not like a boss where it's like oh yeah this is the you know evil evil villain that was animated by ganon that is defending the item I need to get, right? No, it's just this, like, mysterious, like, e evil shadow f link that just... Nah. <laughs> nah. You, you, you gotta best it. You gotta best yourself. That's it. You know what's interesting is, is the inverse of fighting yourself, bringing the very best out of you. One of my favorite Zelda bosses is actually... Um, is going to be the end boss that you fight in Majora's Mask the uh on the moon um because so when you're fighting uh majora majora himself um if you've done certain quests within majora Ma majora's mask you unlock the ultimate boss fighting tool <laughs> the fierce ah. deity mask mm -hmm. and you can go into that final boss fight and just whoop majora's butt like serious ass kicking delivered and uh, um, when I found out that you could do that, I remember my friend giving me guidance on how to fully get this item. This was, you know, uh, back in the early days when we didn't really have the internet to scour for uh, for all the tips. And so uh, together we figured out how to do it. Uh, and getting Majora or uh, getting Majora with a fierce deity uh, um, transformation while you're in that battle is one of the most fun boss fights that I had because it definitely. Uh, um, <laughs> it's a real bend compared to how you actually fight uh, uh, Majora otherwise. Yeah, just being super powered, that's cool. Uh, I don't know how many more Zelda bosses we got to talk about, but I have to talk about the boss. That, it's probably the simplest boss that's been in any Zelda game, but I still think it's one of the best, and that's Moldorm. Uh, Moldorm is from Link to the Past and, uh, Link's Awakening. It's the first boss in Link's Awakening, and it's the third boss in Link to the Past, the boss of the tower. And it's just this, like, armored kind of worm thing that just kind of moves erratically, and you have to hit its tail to damage it. And as you hit it, it goes faster and faster. And that, Alex talked about positioning er earlier. This battle is all about positioning, because if Moldorm hits you, you'll take some damage, but... It can also knock you off of the platform, and you'll fall to the uh, floor below you and have to walk back up and restart the fight. 
Yeah. So Link gets knocked down, but he gets up again. <laughs> and and oh, to, yeah. to fight the boss. And yeah, it's it's a really simple thing. All the boss does is move around. It doesn't do anything else. But it's still in that way so effective. Yeah, and the other the other thing about it is that it's because it's kind of got this chaotic it's got this chaotic movement to it. Mm-hmm. Right? And it's it, it's one of those things where all they need to do to increase the difficulty is just, you know, bump the speed, change the level to have more holes in it, and uh, and then suddenly it's way harder. Just because it's all about, like, kind of reacting to the positioning in real time. And I think that's one thing, actually, that the 2D Zelda games um, can do a bit differently is that uh, the positioning is... And just in general, like, a lot of the puzzle aspects and positioning aspects of the 2D Zelda games are just a bit more involved uh, because you can move in any direction more rapidly and you have kind of the view, the top-down view uh, of all of your surroundings so you don't have a blind spot. Uh, behind you as you would in the the 3d zeldas and in the 3d zeldas because of that because of the fact that you're locked onto the boss it really makes the positioning very different i'm not going to say it's bad it's just different and so in the 2d zeldas they can they can do things with the boss fights that that allow you know things can be behind you that are relevant to your positioning in a, a much more uh uh, you know, just in a much more relevant, just much more relevant, right? Uh, like there might be a pit behind you that you have to be thinking about, uh, whereas that's not really a thing in most of the 3D Zelda arenas. And so the arena, I would say, the arena can be uh, maybe filled with more obstacles in the 2D Zeldas that you have to, you know, be aware of. Um, at least they seem, they see. I would say it seems that way to me. Yeah, I, I I think I agree with you there, definitely. Um, I have a few more bosses that hit up on a series that we've dipped our feet a little bit into, uh, so I thought I'd mention those. Um, one of them is from the Paper Mario series, but the original Paper Mario, and that is Huff and Puff. Now, I loved Huff and Puff for two things. One was his boss music, and I know we'll get into a little <laughs> bit of that later, but... That specific boss fight was a jam to me. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, you just unlock this party member. He's a, uh, he, he's one of the cloud bros, um, in, in Paper Mario. And, uh, the funny thing is, is when you're fighting Huff and Puff, um, he has a specific move where the more you mash the one button on the controller, the stronger this move gets. Oh, dear. Okay. And it is absolutely a blast. Uh, when you're fighting him, uh, there's a specific wave of his attacks that you know you're going to use this new character's ultimate. You know exactly what it does. You know it's good to fight this boss. And it feels so epic. It's like this epic power clash and one of my favorite uh, Paper Mario bosses. Um, of which, actually, the original Paper Mario, I enjoyed pretty much every one of those boss fights. Um, I don't know if you guys can relate to that, but... Uh... Yeah, the Paper Mario series has a lot of good boss fights in general. Yeah. Um, actually, there was one in particular that I really liked, uh, which was from the Thousand Year Door. And actually, the final, the final boss of the game, uh, the Shadow Queen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Really cool fight. Uh, it starts out with like a sort of evilly, uh, like the Shadow Queen has inhabited Peach's body, and Peach is done up in this like sort of evil costume. Um, and then that's like you know the first stage of the fight, and then you move into the second stage. And at first you're like, oh shit, like Peach has been taken. Uh, but then it goes into the second form of her actual form, and then she gets very very powerful yeah uh it is uh i think it's it's the toughest boss fight in the game with the exception of the secret boss um which you have to uh, descend like 100 levels of of bullshit to get to yep. <laughs> um 
But it's a really it's a really cool boss fight that that brings in. Uh, you really gotta like you really gotta like know the game well uh, in order to uh, to beat the Shadow Queen. Uh, you've got to have like a fairly high level. You gotta have like all your party members. Like you have to have the party. Me- you have to understand like what a lot of the different party members' uh, moves are, and you know, because there's some defensive moves that you pretty much have to use in that fight. Yeah. Um, and and the timing, because timing action events is a big part of the Paper Mario games. The timing is super tight to actually. Uh, dodge the Shadow Queen's moves, um, so it's it's really tough. It's really it's got like a good kind of aesthetic going on, and uh, yeah, it's got a, you know kind of the multi stage thing, which always adds interest. And it really is a great uh, final boss, like to to get at the culmination of everything else in that game. Mm-hmm. I never got that far in a uh, game because I only wrecked it, but uh, that sounds awesome. You know what? I'm going to take a very short segue to talk a little about a disturbing fact that I learned about Mario. So, in the manual of the original Mario game, uh, you actually find out that Bowser turned the citizens of the Mushroom Kingdom into the blocks. Mm -hmm. So every time Mario jumps and breaks a block, and you get coins and points... You've just assassinated a member of the mushroom kim- of the mushroom kingdom. A little bit crazy. Well, that's some that's some uh, that's some manual instruction manual horror, all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so one of the other uh, bosses from a series that we've talked about is Metroid Prime, and my favorite boss from that series is Metroid Prime itself, the Queen. Um, who, from her first uh, uh, encounter that you have with her in the original Metroid Prime game, is this very alien entity who just looks absolutely horrific, um, and you find out it's actually just the shell. Uh, And you crack that shell open, and now there's this Metroid Prime creature that looks a lot more like the Metroids that you're used to. You have an epic fight with her. Uh, managing to bring her down um, using the very phazon that uh, corrupts the area, and uh, she rips all the phazon right out of you and vanishes seemingly without a trace. Unless you do good enough in that game to discover the secret ending and find out something is brewing, something with intelligence from the same puddle where your suit ended up in. And uh, from there you discover later on in in the Metroid series that Metroid Prime is now... The mirror image, just like Dark Link, Dark Samus, the uh, very mirror image, and has um, basically assumed command of the pirate army uh, by the second and the third games very effectively to um, become your ruthless opponent. The very darkest qualities of Samus herself um, extended to become the queen of this uh, alien race hell-bent on destroying the Federation. So, as a epic villain arc, just how many times that you fight her, and with her becoming more and more progressively powerful, uh, gaining new tactics and knowledge about you, the player, Samus Aran, um, and using the, these new abilities and tactics on you later, uh, really makes for a very fun recurring boss fight. Um, and uh, she's definitely one of my favorite bosses of all time. I'm seeing that's cool too because like now not only does the boss recur you know, within one game but also persists across games in a way where the villain is actually growing in power which that that's a really cool uh, that's a really cool way to kind of tie the series together yeah. as, as well um, some games have like a recurring boss that doesn't really grow much. Uh, and that can be fun, um, but I feel like with the Metroid Prime uh, series in particular, and and maybe even Metroid as a whole, like there is that somewhat of that feeling of progression that I think is important. Yeah. Um, or at least in the Prime series, in the Prime trilogy, it, it definitely is. Um, contrast something like Bowser. Don't get me wrong, I like Bowser. Bowser is a perfectly like good villain 
uh, and some of the ba some of the Bowser boss fights are in fact really really fun. Um, I'm I'm always gonna be in uh, just so much awe of the Super Mario 64 Bowser boss fights. Um, That's on the list, yeah. Yeah, because <laughs> they are, uh, you know, it's kind of got a similar theme going of it's a recurring boss fight. Uh, each time you see him, he's a little bit harder. Uh, you know, there's a little bit more uh, things going on in the boss fight in terms of new attacks and the stage changes a little bit. And... Also, it's got great music. Oh, I, yeah. I just, the the riffs of the guitar as you open that boss fight are just yeah. perfect. And it's it's so fun just swinging, swinging that big Koopa around and throwing him right <laughs> off into a bomb. You know what I also really like about uh, Bowser throughout the Super Mario 64 series is uh, is that he really doubles down on the um, movement mechanic and mastering it in a chaotic situation. Because in most of Super Mario, uh, you've got fairly precise platforming, um, you know, in a lot of levels where, uh, you know, you have to basically follow a pretty narrowly defined path in order to move beyond it and make your way to the objective. Now, in the Bowser boss fights... Uh, the fact that he's actually manipulating the very level. And by the second fight, he's actually um, tipping the course wildly like a seesaw. Um, and you have to now manage this very chaotic battle situation uh, that he's taking advantage of with his attacks. And yes, you defeat him, but does he give up on that mission? No. He is insane. The very definition of insane. If something fails... Just keep doing it again, but this time add more. And by the third boss fight with him uh, removing entire chunks of the level, actually having it fall away beneath you as that boss fight progresses um, and uh, create such a dynamic situation that's still different from the very from the second boss fight, but uh, um, just d doubling down on have you mastered your platforming? Can you position yourself behind Bowser without winging yourself off the level <laughs> permanently? Um, super, super fun. Yeah. Yeah, something else I actually want to want to bring up, and I think this is very relevant to Bowser in Super Mario 64, is that a boss fight is not just a boss fight, okay? I think that a lot of, like, the best boss fights um, also have a lead-up to them. Uh, Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, the lead-up might be something in terms of, uh, like, a story, like, leading up... It might be, like, through story leading up to a climax um, where there might be dialogue, you know, that uh, you get before the boss fight. Um, but then also just the environment itself. Uh, I think that there's really a lot that can be done in terms of, uh, you know, the atmosphere by having an area that leads up to the boss that gets you into this like oh yeah this is this is going to be this is going to be some some serious this is going to be some serious shit like this is going to be an epic this is going to be an epic something like something big is coming right with super mario 64 obviously uh every bowser fight is preceded by a bowser level and uh, the Bowser levels are a bit different than most of the other levels in the game. Because most of the levels in Super Mario 64 are uh, fairly open, arguably not... Uh, I mean, they are non-linear. Um, it's almost like each level is essentially a, a, mic a small uh, micro open world uh, inside each painting. And that's really cool, but that's not what the Bowser levels are at all. The Bowser levels are like a fast-paced sort of uh, just track. And there's only one direction toward, and that direction is towards the boss. They've got a bit of a different kind of minimalist platforming aesthetic, like up in the air above a lava ocean, which again, you don't see any other levels like that in the game. And it, it every single time, especially because it's recurring, you know, every time you get into one of these, you're like, oh, yeah. And the music has got this driving beat 
where you know, like, yeah, this is getting you, this is getting you pumped, right? It really feels like the gauntlet. That's how I describe it. <laughs> yeah, that's a perfect description of it. There's a gauntlet that you have to run, and there is a boss at the end. And uh, actually, Metroid Prime, uh, the Metroid, the the Metroid Prime boss in Metroid Prime does the same thing yeah. really, really effectively. Uh, the area leading up to Metroid Prime in the final boss ch chamber is a really cool section with some very, very fun, uh, like morph ball platforming and stuff like that, yeah. which is just like, it's a, it's such a cool section. And again, like they have certainly similar ideas throughout other parts of the game, but it's such a, it's, su it's like they, it's like they took the coolest platforming areas that they could build for the game and they put them right there in the uh the sort of leading up trial just yeah. before you get to the final boss and that makes the final boss so much more memorable and you know what just to add a little bit to the that specific uh lead up um comparatively the gauntlet in metroid prime i would say uh is what makes it especially memorable is that it's an area where you've seen Metroids throughout the rest of the game up until the point where you get to this point in the game. And now that you're at the core, the very origin of where all this Phazon has come from, um, you know, this dangerous element that's been corrupting uh, the planet that you're on, uh, you're seeing Metroids in forms that you've never seen anywhere else in the game. And you can just tell that this is truly the breeding ground. It's, it's so very alien. It's almost like the Alien series, you know, and you go, I am seeing things that I've never seen before, and I'm about to see something crazy in here. It definitely gives that vibe that you're, you've truly reached something that is not of the world that you're on. It's highly alien, highly dangerous, um, you know, even from the environment just being so toxic that the armor, which is made of the very material, you know, uh, that it's protecting you against, fails to completely protect you from the radiation down there. So definitely that cool gauntlet-like feeling of um, heading straight on into danger. And the one other thing that I'll say about that boss fight is the surprise that one of the first things that Metroid Prime does when you start beating the crap out of her is she runs away. <laughs> the fact that she's crashing through, you know, to various chambers within that section, um, f fleeing from you only to ultimately lure you to the deepest parts of her lair is truly what makes that uh, a little bit creepier and very memorable indeed. Yeah. yeah. It's funny, actually, your description of that uh, final section brings to mind another game that I think did, you know, a sort of lead up to the final boss really well, which is uh, the original Half-Life. And in Half-Life, most of the game takes place in this uh, kind of industrial research facility, right? But then uh, before you get to the final boss, you know, you get transported to an, a literal alien dimension, um, an alien world called Zen. And then you face the final boss in Zen. And the whole area of Zen is just completely unlike the entire rest of the game. And it gives you this really cool uh, sense of like, oh man, like this is, I'm really out, I'm really out of my depth now. And it's a really hard, uh, it's actually probably, the, it's, it is the hardest area of the game by quite a lot. I would say that there's a jump in difficulty uh, when you get to Zen uh, just before, uh, just at the end of the game there in Half-Life. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's tough, but memorable. I think that's one of the other things, actually, that definitely makes a, an impact, is the, the difficulty uh, of a boss is very important. You know, a boss that's too easy is not going to be satisfying. It's not going to be particularly memorable. Uh, and it might not even... Uh, it might just be... You might not even realize it's a boss if it's too easy. You might just, oh, that's a weird enemy, right? Um, some games definitely make that mistake, but, uh, but in general, bosses are, you know, supposed to be hard. You know, you're, you're supposed to die to them, like, at least once. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe not maybe, at least once. Maybe not at least once. It's not unexpected for you to die to a boss. It should be, it should be, it should be tough. 
right? You should be getting by and be and and you should be worried that you're gonna that you're gonna lose at least. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, there's definitely there's definitely some games that go to the uh, extreme on that, uh, <laughs> where I'm gonna talk about actually a game I don't like. All right. And the reason I don't like it is because of the bosses. It's not because of the rest of the game. The game is Lost Planet 2. <laughs> okay. And All right. here's, here's my problem with Lost Planet 2. The bosses are completely out of proportion in terms of their difficulty with everything else in that game. And I mean, I think this is partly what they wanted because the the big hulking alien creatures are supposed to be a lot more difficult to to face in in that game than uh than the regular creatures but frankly they're just bullshit um i I did not finish lost planet 2 because i was just i was just upset i was upset at the game it uh it was not the boss fights like, especially, like, getting into them. I got maybe, like, a third of the way through or something, and I was just... I was done. I the, I got this one boss. I think it was Acrid X, and I was like, no. I just... <laughs> I couldn't actually beat the damn boss because it's got it's got all, all of the worst abilities um, that you would want in an enemy. It has, like, auto-targeting... It has auto-targeting abilities that, like, home onto you, even if you're trying to dodge it. It, it, it's got abilities that pin you in place so that once you get hit, you just get stuck and continually take more damage. Uh, it's, it's got one of the most uh, frustrate. It's got a whole bunch of regenerative abilities, too. And so I remember the first time I thought I beat the boss, and then it just comes back and it has like full health again. Or like 70% health. And I'm like, really? Because it was such a, it's such a difficult boss. And all the bosses in that game are like that. Uh, they're way, way harder than, than all of the regular non-boss sections of the game. And it just, uh, to me, it just wasn't fun. And it, and the, it took so long. It took so long to actually beat the boss. Even if you knew what you're doing, you know, it's going to be like tw- like 10 or 20 minutes or something ridiculous. Like, it's just such a long boss fight where you need to execute, like, flawlessly for a really long time. Just because the boss is so devastatingly powerful that, <laughs> like, you can only really take a few hits. Oh, and you might run out of ammo, too. Because literally the boss takes so much damage... That if your accuracy is too low, you literally just won't have enough bullets to kill the boss. Jeez. Yeah. Like, that That sounds like the level of, like, you know, a bonus optional boss at the end of the game type shit, but it's just a regular ass boss that you have to beat to progress. Yeah. Yeah, it's just uh, a regular sucks. boss that's not even that far into the game. Like I said, I only got maybe about a third-ish into the game. Maybe half. I can't remember... Exactly, because I didn't finish it, but mm-hmm. the game just... Uh, don't get me wrong, the game was okay um, otherwise, but I just... The boss design was frustrating. Mm-hmm. Now, I wanted to um, maybe step step back a bit, because uh, you, both of you brought up some uh, great points about what makes a good boss. Uh, and on the point of the like lead-up to a boss and how that ma- can make a boss... Uh, my favorite example of that is one that I've talked about before, and it's the spine from Transistor. Yeah. Mm. Because while you're walking up to the boss, there will be certain points where the spine, which is this gigantic, like, metallic, like, skeletal, almost looking, uh, big, like, worm-ish creature, uh, just, like, is attacking you as you're walking up to the boss fight. And it's just, like, shooting gigantic pointy pieces of itself through walls and stuff and as you're walking up to the boss fight uh one of the songs from the soundtrack uh, entitled the spine uh starts playing and it's got lyrics and it's probably my favorite song on the soundtrack because of how it blends um 
the what you're doing with the song and just the approach to the actual boss. The boss fight itself is, I mean, it's it's good because the enti- that entire game is good, uh, but that lead up to it is what makes me remember that boss so well and yeah, why I liked it so much. Yeah, if that boss, if that boss didn't have the lead up of kind of doing these aerial strafing runs on you like as you're getting up to it and the music kicking in to really bring together like the sort of atmosphere of the boss fight it wouldn't it wouldn't be nearly as good Mm -hmm. um like if if you just kind of walked into that that boss fight on its own it would have been kind of like oh okay but but in the context of the full lead up to it it's it's so it's so it's such a powerful it's such a powerful like part of the game Mm -hmm. and one other uh transistor doesn't have that many bosses but they're all really good uh but i i need to shout out the final boss because it does the dark link thing where uh you know you're when you're fighting enemies in transistor you're fighting them on your terms because you can pause the action and go into a tactical view to lay out all of your attacks uh, when you get to the final boss, he pulls out a transistor of his own, which the transistor is the name of like the sword that the main character carries. And the first thing that he does is go into his own tactical view and set up a bunch of attacks to attack yeah. you. So it's a boss fight. It's a fight that's completely different from everything else in the game because it's completely differently paced but it works so well and it's such an oh shit moment yeah yep. that really like you know it punctuates that the end of that game so well and like that's another thing that a boss fight if a boss fight has an oh shit moment it's probably a good boss yeah yep yeah and the the other the other thing i liked about that fight in particular uh similarly to the spine like it i I believe the the music in it is also like a lyrical piece for, uh, if I'm remembering correctly mm-hmm. uh, and it's interesting because I mean most of the time I would say that music with lyrics is bad is a bad fit <laughs> for a vid- for video games but absolutely not the case in transistor I mean I'm sure that we've spoken like we've spoken before about how amazing the music is in Transistor and how amazing the atmosphere is, and we'll probably speak about it again because it is that good. You should play Transistor if you haven't already. Uh, here's to that yeah. Transistor top notch game, the unofficial game of the podcast. <laughs> and it's not a long game either. And I think actually Transistor showcases that a game does not have to be long to be incredible. Yeah, I played through Transistor in one day. Like, I did one sitting where I played I ate a bunch, got up, grabbed something to eat, came back, and played through the rest of it. It gripped me that hard. But, uh, now, I haven't played the, this game. I've only just, like, seen videos of the boss fights. But I think it's it's one of the games that really shits on your thing of, like, oh, lyrics in songs, like, sometimes doesn't work in video games. Uh, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. <laughs> the lyrics, when the lyrics kick in in the boss fights, it's so goddamn hype. And it's it's one of the things that has made me want to play that game, despite not really liking Metal Gear as a series, hating Raiden as a character, and not jiving much with a lot of Platinum's games. Like, But just that, like, you're fighting this boss, you're just like running up the side of a building, and then fucking lyrics just kick in. It's like, yeah! <laughs> Bring the hype. Damn right. Um, from the same series as Transistor, or rather from the same studio as Transistor, uh, Hades. Mm-hmm. The uh, boss battle with Hades definitely, uh, with Hades himself, you know, the, the guy who the main character has daddy issues with is there to bring the beat down. And very much, um, that game is one that you truly have to work your way up to get to him. And I remember the first time facing him, the oh shit moment uh, where he unleashes one of his attacks. Well, actually, just any of his attacks themselves are enough to do you in uh, if you're not careful. But um, the oh shit moment of getting to know the relationship of your main character with this boss 
And then getting up to him and having him make you pound sand the first time you uh, play against him, <laughs> knowing that you actually have to cr crawl your way all the way back up just to get your face pounded in again by him, yeah. um, definitely made for a spectacular uh, boss fight and just journey itself. Because mm -hmm. in that in Hades, like every time you die, you go back to like the the kind of hub little sp space and like the f one of the first things you'll see as you're walking up this little hallway is Hades and if you talk to him he'll just like shit talk you oh it died again and stuff like that why are you even trying and shit like that and so he's constantly antagonizing he's constantly like passive aggressively antagonizing you the entire game but then you know you eventually get to him and then he's aggressively aggressively fighting you <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's it's a it's a fantastic presentation uh throughout. Yeah. And all, all the boss you know what? The other memorable boss for me was definitely Megara because throughout mm -hmm. the course of the game uh there's there's a lot of romantic and sexual tension between yeah. <laughs> her and the main character that you play as and so um, you can actually develop that relationship to the point where uh um her and 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 uh and him have a thing, which is really funny too, because it just adds a new dynamic every time you every time you face her afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Hades definitely prime on the cool uh, boss mechanics, and also just having them in in subtle ways remember you, and also uh, transform the harder that you make the game for yourself. Um, you can come back to the same boss and 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 see their attacks in a whole new way mm -hmm. that kicks your butt a little bit harder until you learn how to face this new mechanic. Yeah. Two more, uh, two more bosses I want to bring up from Hades, and again, like, Hades doesn't have that many bosses either, but they're so well done that, like, they demand being talked about, is, uh, Megara, the first boss you fight. Yep. You, like, you fight her, like, the first, you know, five or six times you're going through that game, but, uh, Megara is one of three Furies in, uh, Greek mythology, and so eventually you get to the point where you fight a different one. And there, it's not hinted that this is going to happen at all, but, like, suddenly you're, like, just right as you're getting used to that fight and you're able to, like, clear it without much trouble, suddenly you got to fight somebody else. And uh, one of the Furies, alternate ones, uh, I don't remember their names, I just remember their colors, like, the, the red one, like, isn't that bad? But, like, the greenish-yellow one that's just, like, all about death is terrifying. I when I I only fought them once, but like I barely scraped scraped out of there with my life, and that was like you know ten or so runs in, uh, ten or so runs getting to that point and fighting the you know the first boss that you're supposed to fight, and I almost get wrecked. I'm like holy shit! So it uh, constantly surprising you. Along with her very memorable lines, murder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, another boss that's really, really interesting, and I actually haven't beaten yet, is uh, Theseus and the Minotaur. Those fucking assholes are, because one of the things in action games is like where your focus is. And in a lot of action boss fights, your focus is on, you know, the one big enemy, what they're sending at you. Your focus is very one directed in one direction. Theseus and the Minotaur, you've got two bosses to fight that are both very capable of pounding your shit in. And you yep. need to be constantly aware of everything that's going on. Uh, and it's what makes that boss so freaking difficult. And I actually think I would be sh shocked to find out that this boss wasn't based off of one of my favorite boss fights, uh, which is from Dark Souls. So th consider this my uh, Dark Souls apology hour for shit-talking it earlier. <laughs> um, Ornstein and Smo. Now, this is a boss fight in um, the area of the game, Anorlando. And Anorlando is this huge area, one of the best examples of scale I've seen in a game. Uh, where it's this very, like, gold, almost Golden Palace-esque area. Very ostentatious. Uh, and, like, everything feels big. The enemies are big. The fucking gigantic... The arrows they shoot at you are big. 
people who play the game will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, and eventually you get to this boss fight, and it's this one, like, guy who's, you know, not much taller than you, but he's got a big spear, and he's pretty quick. And just this gigantic, hulking, fat dude with a hammer. And the hammer is bigger than you, and the end of it is probably like four times your size, and he will hit you with it. <laughs> uh, and this boss fight is... It's so, so difficult, and such a test of the player, because in Dark Souls, one of the things that's super important is what people call animation priority. Basically, when you make an attack, you're committed to that attack. There's not there's no like canceling like in a fighting game or other action games. If you swing your sword out for a heavy attack, you're gonna take the one and a half seconds to swing that sword out, and you're gonna be vulnerable from many different angles of you while you're doing that. So fighting multiple enemies at once is where a lot of the like most difficult parts of Dark Souls end up being. Uh, one of the earlier fights, uh, the uh, t Tower Gargoyles, uh, ends up being like really difficult to win at times just because if they sync their attacks right, because they're using the same attacks, like you can't really approach them. And that's also early on in the game where you don't have the breadth of options to maybe be able to take them out. If you don't pick, didn't pick a magic class at the beginning, for example, it's, it can be really tough. But by the time you get to Ornstein and Smoke, you have a lot more options available to you. Uh, so it becomes this ridiculous like dance of trying to hit each of these different enemies while they're just relentlessly throwing offense at you. And there's big pillars in the stage that you pretty much need to hide behind to make sure you're not constantly getting hit. But Smo's hammer will destroy those pillars over time. So if the fight continues to go on, you're going to lose a lot of cover. And what ends up happening is if you, when you finally are able to take out one of them and you think, okay, now the boss fight is going to be a piece of cake so I only have to focus on one. If you defeat Ornstein first, Smo gets pissed, slams his hammer down on Ornstein's corpse, which electrifies his hammer, and suddenly his attacks have an even greater area of effect, and do magic damage on top of that. Which magic damage, uh, most shields, if you just block magic damage, you're gonna still take a fair amount of damage yourself. It doesn't block everything. Whereas with just pure physical damage, a lot of shields can completely block pure physical damage. If you defeat Smo first, however, Ornstein, his heart grows three sizes that day, as well as the rest of him. <laughs> he becomes gigantic, and suddenly you have a gigantic, extremely fast jerk to uh, try to defeat. So it's one of the most involved boss fights I've ever taken part of. One of the most difficult, one of the most challenging. I smashed my head against this stupid thing so many times. And in Dark Souls, you can summon um, other players into your game to help you, but I decide no. I'm going to beat this fucker without summoning anybody else. Because this That's is awesome. the true challenge. And it must have taken me almost 20 tries. But I was finally able to do it. Partially cheesing it by poisoning them <laughs> with magic. But, you know, that was an instance where I got to the point where I'm like, okay, my strategy isn't working. I gotta look at what my other options. And they, I saw this poison spell. Like, I wonder if this works. I did. They've got, ma they've got magic. You've got magic. Yeah, so that's that's a fantastic boss fight. It's one of my favorites. Like, maybe top three. That's awesome. Uh, from a game that I have a lot of problems with. While we're here, another uh, awesome boss fight in Dark Souls uh, is the Taurus Demon, who is, like, the second boss fight in the game, but, again, is a boss that shows... It, there's so many different things going on. Uh, you're, fight, you're fighting the Taurus Demon on a fairly narrow, like, top of a wall. And he is this big guy, like, four times your size. Again, huge hammer, axe thing, I think. I don't know. I don't quite remember. And he'll, like, be jumping at you, swinging this thing at you. And if you try and fight him, like, mano a mano on that, 
area, like, it's it's a challenging boss fight. You gotta be able to, like, dodge through his legs and start attacking him from behind and stuff. It's so pretty good there. Uh, but there's also a uh, ladder next to the door that you come out of to fight this boss that leads to a tall circular arena. So you can climb that ladder and you can start pelting the Taurus demon with ranged attacks if you have them. And you can do that for a while. And then, but if you do that for too long, the Taurus demon will jump up there and fight you on that circular arena. So, you know, a completely different stage, really, to fight the boss. But if you're paying attention to how you've been playing the game so far, uh, one of the things in the tutorial area is you learn that you can do a jumping attack. It's basically the way that the game expects you to fight the first boss, where you do a jumping attack off this ledge, and you smack down onto him for like half his health. Well, you can do that to the Taurus Demon too. So if you remember that from the tutorial area, uh, you can put it into practice on this second boss fight that you have, which is, you know, actually an example of great tutorializing in a game that has a really shitty tutorializing. <laughs> Uh, so that, again, adds another dimension to the boss fight. But the final dimension of the boss fight, which I think is the most fun one, is the Taurus Demon attacks, does an attack where he attacks you, and then he kind of, like, jumps back. If you position yourself just right, he will jump off the wall and die. Ha! <laughs> wow. So you can completely cheese the boss if, if you know that this is a thing you can do, or if you just stumble upon it by accident. It's really hilarious. And the last thing I'll bring up about the Taurus Demon is that you get to a point later on in the game where it's a regular enemy, and that's that's a, a trope that I really love in video games, where you fight a boss early on that becomes a regular enemy later, just to show yeah. like how far you've come. And in this particular area, there's multiple Taurus Demons roaming around, as also multiple Capra Demons, which are another boss that you fight. So if you're not careful and you aggro, uh, you know, two or, God forbid, three of them at once, that can be a really messy, messy encounter. <laughs> yeah, I love, I, love that, I love that trope of making the boss a regular enemy later on. Uh, really just helps cement, like, the sort of the feeling of power that your character has later in the game. Because uh, sometimes... If you're getting stronger, but all the enemies are also getting stronger, it, it, you know, you might forget just how far your character has grown, whether it's an RPG where your stats have increased or just an action game where you have like way better weapons mm -hmm. or, or if you're just better at the game. Yeah, totally. Um, something else actually that you kind of mentioned there a little bit was, uh, you know, the, the comedic aspects of boss fights. Yes. <laughs> and uh, that's something actually that we talked a little bit about characterization uh, in, in boss fights of villains. And I definitely think that boss fights uh, can provide, you know, some unique opportunities uh, for comedy in a video game as well. Um, one game in particular that I think has uh, uh does this well uh spider-man 2 uh spider-man 2 has uh, a couple boss fights that stand out to me as being really funny um one of them is a fight with shocker and uh the main reason it's funny is because you fight shocker a couple times and uh you know after having seen shocker in the past uh, previously you know you see him and you fight him again and this time he's he you know he's back for back for revenge against spider-man and he's you know got obviously he's got different moves set and he's more powerful but uh he's also got a bit of a different costume and of course being spider-man spider-man cracks like oh shocker you've been reupholstered <laughs> <laughs> which is just so funny uh and it's also it's it's such a funny joke in the context of, of a recurring boss because so many times recurring bosses do just get like a bit of a different costume and it's like does that actually make sense maybe not but it's very common and it's uh 
it, it, it makes the boss feel a little bit newer, um, even if it may not be what, you know, a, a real a real uh, situation of uh, fighting the same person would be like, but but it is a common trope. And so lampshading that trope uh, can be some great comedy and you're able to get that sort of development, character development leading to comedic situations really well in with bosses and recurring villains. Yeah. Um, there's another villain in Spider-Man 2, Mysterio. <laughs> And this then, is one of two things I know about Spider-Man 2. Now, one, the web-swinging is sick, and two, the Mysterio boss fight. The, yeah, yeah, so the yeah the web-swimming... The, the we, uh, web-swimming. Uh, the web-swinging is really good. Um, and Mysterio... So you, you fight Mysterio the first time, and it's, uh, it's a bit of a weird section. Mysterio has this, like, hall of mirror kind of, like, weird section of the game that's actually pretty difficult to get through um uh, compared to a lot of other uh areas in that game just because it's it's confusing and it's more puzzly um than most of the other sections and then his first boss fight you get to him and it's actually very imposing because mysterio's like in this grand theater and he's like a hundred feet tall or something um <laughs> but of course mysterio is a bit of a trickster and um so that that boss fight is really cool and fun and um uh, and then the thing is like you know he he escapes right and you you meet mysterio again uh later in the game and now here's spoilers if you want to play spider-man 2 you know don't listen to the ne this next part because it is incredible and Essentially, you go into a convenience store, which is kind of like, what? And Mysterio's robbing the convenience store. And you're like, wow, okay. You know, how far he's fallen, right? And he he turns around and he's like, Spider-Man! Right? Because he's upset. And, uh, you know, Spider-Man cracks a joke about the fishbowl on his head, as usual. Um, but then his health bars start, start, um, uh, filling up and he has not one, not two, um, but I think three or maybe even four health bars. <laughs> All right. And so you're, you're gearing up for a tough boss fight, right? You're, you're, you're thinking, oh my God, what, what is this boss fight going to be? What did I just get myself what into? What did I just get myself into here? Yeah. And you go up to him, one punch, all the health bars go to zero, and he's knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Just in one hit. And it's such a it's such a funny inversion or subversion of uh, of like all the tropes about a boss fight that, that it has amazing comedic value. Um and it's it's unexpected because it's not like that's not a common thing that happens anywhere else in the game. There's no other boss that's like a joke boss, but you know that one is, and it hits super hard because you're not expecting it. And I really love that. And it's because he was a boss pr prior to this, and so they're able to they're able to lean on these tropes of how a recurring boss fight works and how the bosses get stronger, mm -hmm. you know, when you subsequently meet them and, you know, often have multiple stages and it implies all this stuff uh, through like showing you the health bar populating and stuff like this and the dialogue. And then it just totally subverts it. Yeah. Um, amazing. Yeah. Which is, which is amazing. Yeah. Like, that moment and fight would have been hilarious if you hadn't fought him the first time, but because you fought him in a real boss fight the first time, it makes it that much better. Yeah. Because yeah. it just it sets your expectation and then flips it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, so good. You know what's another boss um, that doesn't have the comedy element but definitely subverts your uh, normal boss uh, elements? is Mewtwo from the first uh, generation of Pokemon. When you get to him, and here you are, you're in a boss. But unlike most bosses, 
you don't actually want to defeat him. <laughs> you yeah. want to capture him. Mm-hmm. And hilariously, this is even tougher because the stakes are so raised when Mewtwo's health gets low. And you have to uh, now rely on whatever Pokeballs that you have with you. And uh, if you were enterprising enough, you might even have a Master Ball to wield against Mewtwo. But that being said, if you don't, it's going to be one hell of a fight. <laughs> yeah, because Mewtwo in that first game is quite a bit higher level than even the champion. Yeah. Uh, and does Mewtwo... I've It's been so long. Does that version of Mewtwo no recover? I think it does. Oh, dear I lord. Does, yeah. Oh, that's so frustrating. Yeah. Because I remember trying to catch, capture Lugia. Oh, and it knows recover. And it's yeah. so fucking... I mean, so any, any boss fight, any boss fight with recovery... A health recovery is always challenging. Yeah, I've got um, I've got an example of that, man. But with Pokemon, it's even worse because you can't if you get the boss to low health, you can't or yeah. the, the Pokemon you you don't want to kill it because you're trying to catch it. Yeah, it's already yeah. this like teetering balancing act of you can't hurt it too much. Yeah, I really have to choose your moves wisely, and then it just recovers half. It's like God fucking damn it. Yep. <laughs> uh. Pokemon has some great bosses, actually. I've got a couple here. Um, and they, they they exhibit two different, like, tropes that I love. Um, now, we've talked about the, you know, recurring boss that you fight a few times and then you fight at the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that can be really effective when done well. Another thing that, when done well, can be effective, though it's really easy to mess up, is if the final boss ends up being a twist. Like, so, yeah. uh, something that you didn't see coming completely. Believe it or not, the first Pokemon game does both of these things. Yep. Because you fight Gary motherfucking Oak the entire game, and then once you finally get to the Elite Four, you know, the Elite Four, there's only four of them, right? You beat <laughs> the four of them, and who shows up? Oh, Gary was just here, like, five minutes before you, man, and beat them himself, so now you gotta fight Gary if you wanna be the champion. And this is actually almost foreshadowed in the rest of the game, because every time you go to a gym and you, like, read the little blurb at the front of the gym, it says, like, you know, Brock, the rock hard something or other, I don't know, that's in keeping with the anime, uh, uh, who's beaten him? Gary. Like, (laughs) his name always shows up, he's always beaten every single gym leader before you every, throughout the game, so it's... No wonder that he also beat the Elite Four before you as well. And, but then you have to fight him at the end. So that's, like, that's a that's a really cool moment as a kid to, like, think you've you've won, think you've tried, but then, nope. This guy, this jerk is back to yep. to steal your glory and you gotta you gotta finally beat beat him senseless. So good. Awesome, yes. Uh, another uh champion that I think is my favorite champion of the entire series is uh, in Diamond and Pearl, uh, Cynthia. You Mm. encounter, like most champions in the later, in pretty much every game, Ruby onwards, you encounter them a few times uh, throughout the game and they, you know, give you some items, give you some guidance. Uh, Then when you get to the Elite Four, you generally never know who the champion's gonna be. You can usually guess if if you've been paying attention, but Diamond and Pearl's Elite Four, for me, was the toughest to beat, uh, or to even get to Cynthia. But then when you get to Cynthia, uh, you know that it's on, because this plays. Yep. Just this crazy piano song starts coming through, and like, it's discordant and crazy, and you know like, oh shit, it's on before you fight Cynthia. And Cynthia's team is one of the scariest in any Pokemon game. It's so good. The first Pokemon she sends out is Spiritomb, <laughs> who is uh, Ghost Dark. And at that point in the series, because Fairy Type hadn't been introduced yet, it has zero weaknesses. So, you, you know, it can, like, there's no, like, clear cut way ha- on how to beat it without, you know, taking some damage back. Then she's also got a Lucario, a Milotech, uh, 
and her fucking Garchomp. Oh, yeah. Garchomp is oh, one of the scariest yeah. Pokemon ever because it's just it's fast and it hits really fucking hard. Yep. So like at that point in the game, like you just might not have something that can a withstand its attacks or b be faster than it to take it down because usually you're if you're uh, have a big grinding to all hell, you you're going to be under leveled when you come up to the champion. So that fight is really really awesome. Yeah. However, I, I I don't think I would put Cynthia on this list just because of that. But here's the thing. She kind of pulls a Mysterio in the next game. Where in black and white, when you're going through the post-game area, you are going through these towns and you get to this town that's a nice like seaside, beachside town. The music's very calming. The first thing on your right is a Pokemon Center. You're probably going to go into that first. Heal up your Pokemon and maybe buy some items. It's good. You go out and the first house that you see on the left of the entrance, you walk into. And that piano theme starts playing. Ha! And Cynthia's just there. You haven't seen her the entire rest of the game. And the like trainer like exclamation mark pops up over her head. And she walks towards you, and it's like, oh, fuck, what did I just get myself into? <laughs> Thankfully, she gives you the op- option to decline the battle, because if you do battle her at that point, like, uh, she's going to completely wipe the floor with you. Yeah. Because, again, she still has a bunch of really a really great team comp, and has extremely high-level Pokemon. She's... Basically, like, you know, the bonus boss that's in a lot of Pokemon games, except she's just in a random fucking house. That's so funny. <laughs> that is pretty funny. So that's an a, a absolutely incredible thing right there. I think uh, one of my favorite bosses is Magus from Chrono Trigger. Oh, you want to talk about fantastic boss themes, Magasus is, like, a top five for me. Yeah. It's so good. And just, like, like Magus as a character, how complex he is and how integral he is to Chrono Trigger, the entire story. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everything from him... Uh, another character in your party named Frog has been cursed to be a frog. Um, and the whole shenanigans is that, you know, he used to be a squire whose knight was killed by Magus. And so Magus is a big deal. And then you face him, and you actually have the option of him joining your team basically by threat of force. Being like, (laughs) if if you go down that path, he'll join your team and, like, and, 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 you know, this is happening. Yeah. Um, But, uh, yeah, just everything about Magus, I I, I can't even, like, uh, oh, my gosh. Yeah, like... The, the mechanics of the boss fight is really interesting where he is constantly changing uh, what like elemental type he's weak against. So yep. if you hit him with the wrong thing, he'll be healed and he'll counter-attack for like, a fuck ton of damage. Uh, and then he'll switch phases later on where he'll just start sh- throwing like gigantic shadow attacks at you. It's, it's a really challenging boss fight. It's, it's like the first real, like, step up in difficulty throughout that game. And, like you were saying, with the whole, like, you know, the character Frog in your party has, like, such a beef with him. And so that already gives you, like, a really great motivation for fighting this character. And, like, you know some backstory about it. But the crazy thing is, is that, like... You only know half of Megas' backstory, basically. You learn the other half of, like, where he came from in the first place and why why he's super significant and all that later on after you beat him. Yeah. Uh, and, like, some of it before he joins your party and some after. And so it's, it's a fantastic character progression in that game that, Truly. like, starts as a villain, great boss fight, and then, like, redemption afterwards. It's... Yeah, one of the best uh, character arcs I've ever seen. There is another, and oh my gosh. So I put this on this list without actually... I'm not 100% sure of the English name of this game. It was a JRPG. It came out... (laughs) You know what? I think the name might be Shadow's Tale. But anyway, I'm going to describe this scenario to you because it was so, so good. 
So one of the basic enemies in this is a clone. Um, and the first clones that you face are like fodder enemies. They're mutants, they're terribly deformed, and they're quite easy to beat. As the game progresses, uh, there's a mad scientist who's creating these clones, and these clones get progressively better throughout the story. And at one point, so you're one of the one of the two characters. Um, on, well, there's two characters on your team. There's an enchanted sword that has a personality and it's pretty awesome. And then there's the wizard who basically wields the sword, and they kind of have like a great relationship. It's like you know a man and his dog. <laughs> so anyway, you get into the mad scientist's lair, and you're battling your way through. And, um, you know, you basically find out, okay, so all these clones are coming from this one character who's, like, asleep in the cryo chamber and is being, you know, has the ever-living hell clone out of him. And the clones at this point are quite competent. They're very deadly. And so anyway, um, after you beat the mad scientist, uh, he wakes up um, and, like, takes the injured mad scientist with him and traps your characters in this chamber that is about to explode. And so at this point, you as the character have to decide who's going to make the sacrifice in order to make it out of here. Is it the wizard or his magical sword? Mm. And so you have to make this epic choice, which totally colors the rest of the story later and comes back to bite you because if you, if you sacrifice the sword, then the wizard, his character arc, becomes having this void where his companion, this, um, you know, mystical creature, is now gone. And so every shop that you go to, he's basically, like, you can tell he's totally yearning to find the ultimate weapon. <laughs> and that's his character arc, is to build this ultimate weapon to go beat the ever-living shit out of, uh, out of the OG, uh, you know, guy who's, who's created this army and caused him so much grief. On the other hand, what's even crazier is if, if the, the wizard... Um, takes the blow and the magic sword survives and the magic sword basically uh, becomes corrupted and like consumed with grief and so throughout the series the sword you know is now the replacement character who you have left behind he doesn't have any of the main abilities but he becomes progressively more dark and mm -hmm. is like um, yeah towards the end actually becomes a mini boss you have to defeat at one point when he takes it too far and like becomes completely corrupted and in fact along the way you have the opportunity for him to like become increasingly corrupted before finally um essentially he just wants to skewer every last clone there is um in in revenge for his uh for his fallen friend until he gets to the end and then you just see him like legit go through uh, the, the wizard, you know, is now, or the mad scientist is in really poor condition, really poor health, because you beat the shit out of him the last time. And then his clone and ultimately the original, and the last thing is that the sword drives itself through the heart of, uh, of the OG guy, and then, uh, you guys all have to take it down, because it's just, um, beyond corrupted. And it's just this amazing arc where either story path that you take there, um, completely, like, this boss has left trauma on your, on your entire team and has an effect long after, uh, that one encounter. Mm -hmm. And for me, that, uh, struck me as pretty cool. Uh, um, it was actually a game that I didn't fully play on my own. I could only play it when I was hanging out with my friend. And so her and I, uh, would boot up the game. We had this one save file and we made it through. Um, and, uh, yeah, so she, she actually could understand the subtitles and took the time to actually explain to me basically what was going on in this game because it was largely took place in Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd love for you to figure out what the, what the name of that game is because that sounds uh, like a really interesting thing if the rest of the uh, writing and progression is up to par with that moment then that, that could be a, an amazing JRPG that I haven't played and I yeah. need to know if that's the case. Yes. <laughs> I will see if I can find this. Cool. Uh, God, I've got like three different segues. <laughs> um, let's, let's take it a different way. Take it away. I've got another game. All right. That has a number of good bosses. Um, and uh, yeah, that game's Cave Story. Yes. Oh, yeah. And that was one of my segues. <laughs> yeah. So 
I think in terms of some of the things we've talked about, what makes a good boss fight, uh, Cave Story, pretty much every boss fight in Cave Story has like a lot of the aspects we've talked about that make a good uh, a good boss fight. Uh, right off the top, the first boss you fight in Cave Story uh, is a toaster named Balrog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kick-ass theme. <laughs> with a great theme, yeah. And uh, so Balrog's a fun boss that is a recurring boss. I think you fight him three times in the game. Um, I think that's correct. Yeah. And, uh, you know, each time he gets harder and changes things up a little bit. Uh, but also, like, he, he does have a, a bit of... Uh, bit of uh, character development of sorts with his dialogue as well. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the times you encounter him at, at the Blink Up boss fight, <clears throat> you talk to him and he's just like, hey. And, like, nothing else, really. But then, like, like, okay. And then when you try to leave, he's like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, so, so he, he's, a, he's a fun... He's kind of like a, a fun villain to, to fight. Um, and... Yeah, yeah, great, great theme. Um, fairly, fairly, uh, fairly simple for the most part, I would say. But that's that's not a bad thing. I mean, after all, he's the first boss you run into. Um, but uh, definitely does like the recurring, recurring development of the character and of the, uh, of the mechanics kind of getting more complex with him over time. So there's that. That's fun. Um, and there's a lot of other good bosses in Cave Story, um, but one of my favorite bosses uh, in terms of a technical perspective of like a really interesting boss fight is uh, Monster X. Mm, yeah. And Monster X is a really fun one because it's this kind of like crazy like machine that's controlled by the monster that is like going down like it's 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 in motion and you're riding it uh through the boss fight uh so it's a really it's really cool uh and it's different uh it's pretty different than a lot of the other boss fights uh it's also it's pretty tough um i remember the first time i played cave story it actually took me quite a bit of uh tries to beat monster x because it's a it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty tough boss um and uh, yeah, it stayed with me as one of the more uh, more fun ones because the actual boss fight itself is just really fun. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's got a lot of uh, uh, good platforming involved in trying to like evade all the attacks and uh, fun boss. And then the the last boss I want to talk about. I don't know. There might be are there. We'll see. We'll see. I've got a boss that I want to talk about from okay. Cave Story. Okay, because we'll see if you if you name it. Uh, well, the last boss I want to talk about from Cave Story actually is the secret boss. So okay, do we want to? Okay, well, all right. My mine's not the secret boss. Let's so. talk about that one first. Okay, but mine's almost mine's kind of the final boss. Um, the core. I love the core. The core is my favorite boss from Cave Story. Uh, the first time you fight it. Uh, and actually, one of the reasons why I think it's so great is touching up on something we talked about almost at the beginning of this podcast, what you brought up about how the 2D Zelda games, uh, just how the perspective of that, uh, they could do a lot more with them uh, than some of the 3D boss fight, Zelda boss fights. Um, because in a lot of action games, uh, the boss fights tend to take place on like one screen. Like, a lot of Zelda boss, the 2D Zelda boss fights are on one screen. You kind of have knowledge of everything that's happening. With the core, the stage that you fight him on is actually bigger than one screen. So you it's got verticality to it and left and right movement. It doesn't move, but the arena is just very large. The core is at the right of the screen, and it opens and shuts, so you can only have limited times when you can attack it. Shoots a variety of projectiles at you. What makes this boss fight so great is that uh, the platforms are laid out in a way that you kind of have to, like, you have to maneuver pretty precisely to be able to evade its attack, get up to it, and shoot it in the face while it's open. At the same time that all this is happening, 
there's water that rises up and falls down, which completely changes how you're moving through the environment as you're fighting this boss. And the boss at times will uh, push you away from it towards the left side of the screen so that the boss is now off the screen and it'll, but it'll still be like shooting at you. So you need to like, you see these shots coming from the side of the screen that you have to dodge while you're approaching it. So the first time you fight the core is uh, a pretty great boss fight, uh, just from like a movement kind of perspective, like traversing that area to like get back to it, continue fighting it, keep the pressure up. Uh, one of the things that makes it cool as well is that there's another character in Cave Story called Curly, Curly Brace, uh, who is initially knocked out during the fight, but she joins you partway through and will also be attacking it. And that's that's something pretty new to that experience when you're playing it. You don't really have an ally. At times you have Curly stuck to your back and she'll fire behind you when you fire in front, but this is like the only time you really have an ally fighting alongside you that's like not attached to you really. Yeah. <laughs> not not basically just like a twin shot from like a Gradius or something, in effect. Uh but the core comes back at the end of the game as the undead core. And it's got even nastier moves. The water me- the water rising and falling mechanic is out, but what's there instead is you have two sub bosses at the same time. One is a uh, corrupted version of a Mamiga that's been falling around with just this weird little bunny creatures that is super fast and charges at you and jumping all around the stage. And the other one is a corrupted version of Misery, one of the bosses you've fought. Uh, previously, who is floating through the air and summoning uh, various minions to attack you, which is actually nice because you can refill your ammo and uh, some of your weapon experience from those. Uh, but no, but the designer knew that you know keeping her alive would allow you to keep recovering. So if you defeat uh, the possessed Mimiga first. Uh, misery becomes a lot tougher. She starts summoning fish missiles to shoot at you. <laughs> uh, at the same time, you know, the core is bearing down on you with a bunch of different projectiles. And you actually only need to defeat the core to win this boss fight. Uh, so that's that's something that I actually like to like to try doing, is beating the core without beating uh, the other two characters. Because, I mean, like, the possessed Bamiga, like... I don't really want to be killing that. It's like a companion you've known throughout the game. You don't want to... Just because she's gone berserk doesn't mean you got to kill her. And, yeah, so that's, like, an interesting, like, self-challenge that you can uh, do to yourself. Um, and the the boss theme for the final fight against the core is a fucking banger. It's so good. It is the happiest final boss theme you'll ever hear. Like, the most <laughs> upbeat. Because a lot of the music in that game... Is fairly upbeat. There's some really like mellow and sad music in there too, but they chose the upbeat final boss theme for whatever reason. So fits really well uh, and is a great like combination of things. Like having to deal with these three different enemies that do three very different things is a very dynamic boss fight. Yeah, it is a really it is a really cool one. Uh, but uh, going back to the secret boss who I've yeah, never beaten so, because he's such a motherfucker. Oh, yeah, so getting getting to the secret boss though. Uh, the secret boss in Cave Story is a hell of a boss. Um, <laughs> I I I honestly I can't remember if I did beat him, I only beat him like once. And even then I'm not sure if I actually did. Um, so the final the the secret boss uh, has a lot going for for it in terms of like interest. First of all, it is really tough to get to the secret boss. There's a section, uh, a hell, aptly named. Uh, yeah, uh, and the the hell area is very difficult to get through. Uh, even getting through hell to the final uh, to the secret boss uh, is a challenge. And the thing is that uh, in order to even have a chance at the secret boss, you have to get through hell without having taken too much damage. 
because the final uh the secret boss itself is it's just it is a tough it is a tough boss it has multiple forms uh just crazy projectiles mm -hmm. music's bumping you got like the design uh of some of the forms it's just really really cool and it's a very imposing boss fight um uh, you'll be hard pressed to beat it though because it is it is incredibly tough yeah like the first form uh isn't that bad like when you come up to the final boss, secret boss his name is balos b-a-l-l-o-s uh and he's a dude with a big round head and you know you fight him uh if you beat him though he transforms into the ball of Balos, which is this gigantic, like, ten times your size, just ball that's just his gi gigantic fucking dome. And that starts jumping around and summoning a bunch of other things to come at you, and then eventually it gets, like, smaller balls surrounding it and just rolling around the stage. It's, it's so hectic of a boss fight, and it's the gauntlet of getting through hell to even attempt it, like, it reminds me of a roguelike, almost. <laughs> like, yeah. the, the amount of mastery you need to have of the pre of hell to be able to get to Balos and even see its, like, other forms. It's, it's such a tough boss, but, like, it's an example of where a super challenging boss is memorable in the right way. Because... I've certainly had some bosses that are, like, almost on the level of that Lost Planet 2 boss that you've described that are just challenging to the point of being frustratingly memorable. I only remember them because I hate them. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Balos is so, so good. Yeah, Balos is a really good... And, and the, thing about, the thing about the Balos fight is that it doesn't feel unfair because of... Uh, like bullshit right that's it, important it it just like it legitimately just feels like you are facing off against an incredibly powerful enemy uh with you know fast attacks a variety of of attacks um and and usually frankly you are usually facing him uh where you yourself are not in peak condition mm -hmm. uh you, it, it like getting through hell without taking damage is almost impossible um there and there's minimal there's minimal recovery options in hell as well yeah um, there's like a little bit before you fight balos and that's about it yeah so getting to balos with full health itself pretty much doesn't happen um most of the time that i would get to balos i would be at half health or less Mm -hmm. uh, that's assuming I even got there, uh, because so many times, you know, you have to practice just to get through hell at all. Yeah. And one other thing that we haven't mentioned yet about hell is that one of the big things of cave story is, uh, leveling up your weapons. Uh, when you kill enemies, they drop experience for your weapons. When you hit, you lose experience. Your weapons have three levels, well, four levels, zero to three, I suppose. And... Generally, for most of the game, you're going to have all your weapons at, like, you know, level 2 or 3 when you're fighting. Like, at its most powerful or close to its most powerful. When you go into hell, all your weapons reset to 1. So, yeah. chances are, by the time you fight Balos, like, there's pretty much no way to have all your weapons leveled up fully. Like, you might have 1, maybe 2. So, you got to pick and choose, like, what you want to use. Because... Some weapons are great at getting through hell, but aren't necessarily good against Balos, like the uh, the fireball. Fireball's great for getting through hell, but against Balos, it's it's tough when he's in the ball form to like you literally can't hit him with the thing unless you're flying. So it's it's an example of just like diminished resources fighting a super tough enemy. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, because of sort of the choices you got to make and, um, you know, the challenge in getting there, like, it's it, it, it makes the, like, the boss just has this epic feel to it, and it's this huge challenge. And if you do actually manage to beat the boss, it is so satisfying. Um, and 
it's going to take a while. <laughs> truly, truly true. Yeah, because... Uh, and even even knowing... I mean, even getting into hell, like, uh, you might not even know that that area is there. Um, it's not... It's a secret, for it, sure. It is a secret, yeah. Uh, so, one of the things that I mentioned about... You know, the final boss being a twist. One of the games that I think weirdly did that the best was Super Smash Bros. Brawl in the Subspace Emissary <laughs> mode. Because throughout that mode, you're, you see the titular Subspace Emissary, which is this like floating set of eyes with a green robe, green hat, who is bas- set- setting off, you know, subspace bombs that basically turn a place into a void. And you see glimpses of Ganondorf and Bowser, like, who ap- appear to be the uh, the masterminds behind this thing. But as you go through that game, you eventually find out that the Subspace Emissary doesn't want to be doing what it's doing. It's actually brought the robot, <laughs> which is a hilarious reveal. Yep. But as you approach the end, you find out that uh, Bowser and Ganondorf are actually pawns of this weird blue man called taboo yep. and this motherfucker is so goddamn tough yeah because in one of his one fucking move where he shoots those three circular blasts that you need epic timing to be able to not get insta killed by yeah he's the reason why i have not beaten like all-star mode on the highest difficulty because he's so goddamn tough yeah and like, that reveal combined with how challenging of a boss that he is. Well, okay. Maybe not challenging. Challenging might not be the right word. Ch- the boss is challenging for everything else, except for that, like, burst attack, which is just bullshit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, the other moves that he does are, like, pretty interesting to have to dodge and, like, manage your way through. Not taking damage while also damaging it, but that that, that part's a bit much. <laughs> One of my favorite bosses, speaking of, is definitely Master Hand. Master Hand is oh, right yeah. up there as, like, flavor-wise, like, you know, in the original Smash Brothers, uh, you know, where the reveal that, oh, you know, it's it's like the hands playing with the toys, and, the, and that's what you're facing, you know? Um, and uh, also just the introduction of Crazy Hand yeah. is, you know, mad counterpart, which is, you know... The, the, the boss with regular Master Hand seems civil compared to Crazy Hand, who's just doing crazy flips and all sorts of weird shit. Yeah. Um, it's, and, very, it's, uh, it's very true to life, because, like, my right hand, that's the Master Hand. My left hand, that's the Crazy Hand. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, an interesting boss that also... Uh, who, who, who has a special place in my heart as being ultra-creepy subverts that twist and kind of resembles a little bit Master Hand is uh, the final boss from Wario Land 3. Oh, yeah? Okay. So in Wario Land 3, uh, Wario discovers this magical little toy world box thingamajiggy, which he gets sucked into, and uh, he meets a dark, mysterious figure who promises him that he can get out. If only he'll just provide this mysterious figure with certain key elements from within this toy world. And, uh, true to its form as being a shadowy, creepy figure, it's the final boss. What is this thing? An evil clown with floating (laughs) hands. Oh, dear. And is the only boss in Wario Land 3 who can actually kill you. That's right. Right. This boss is out to fucking murder Wario. Right, because in Wario Land 3, isn't Wario, like, technically invincible? Yep. Yeah. (laughs) So that's, that's a, like, scary... Uh, <laughs> subversion of game mechanics right there. Yeah, definitely one of my favorite characters. And just, you know, scratches that itch of this thing just gives me the gross clown vibes that you get from those creepy clown movies <laughs> of like, what is this thing and and why am I facing it now? Why didn't I see this all along? That the mysterious figure who, you know, in this creepy temple who's asking me for favors is is going to stab me in the back once I, <laughs> once I meet his uh, uh, conditions. So, yeah, definitely way up there, Master Hand and and his funny counterpart. Now, interestingly, the evil clown, uh, I found out um, 
reading about this is actually Rudy, the villain from Dr. Mario. Oh, well, that's an interesting little canonical piece of juicy info there. Yeah, so, um, yeah, two, two of my favorite. I think one of the last bosses that I had on my list, which I'll mention, is actually the boss, uh, the titular boss from Warning Forever, which is a game I have talked about before. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Warning Forever is... A series of boss runs. Every level you face the boss. Okay, so so yeah, yeah. So speaking of like, so Warning Forever is a boss rush game. Yeah, it's only boss rush. That's the only mode, effectively. Is it a boss in boss rush? Yes. Yes, definitively. I and... suppose it is called boss rush, but it's just it's funny because there are games that are entirely boss rush, and so really all the enemies are bosses. Yeah. And or what... are none of them bosses. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What I truly love about that game that keeps coming back is that this boss takes the method that you use the most, you know, the mechanic that you exploited to be able to make it through bullet hell and defeat it and turns it against you the next round. Mm -hmm. And definitely that is something that makes uh, Warning Forever one of my favorite boss games um you know to be able to defeat because it's really turning what you learn against you and you know it's like player versus self taken to the extreme form um and uh yeah definitely yeah cool. if you if you like top down space space like sh shoot em ups uh you should definitely play warning forever if you haven't haven't already because if you can find it yeah. Oh God! If you can find it, yeah. Uh, it's a bit of an older game these days, uh, but it's. I would say it's probably the most fun, purely boss rush game that I've ever played. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I mean, there's not a lot of those. I could think of two other ones, um, but one of them I suck at, so I don't. I can't really. Uh, Judge's quality too much, and the other I haven't played. Um, the one I suck at is the Punch Out games. Those are boss okay, rush games. Okay, I, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, like, and the other, uh, you know, one, what, maybe one of the most critically acclaimed games I've ever heard of that I haven't played is uh, Shadow of the Colossus. Uh, people love that game, and that's all I... bosses, right? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't played it. Although, from what I understand, I would not describe it as a boss rush game. Yeah, okay, it's not a boss rush game, but it is a sequence of bosses game. It is a boss game. <laughs> yeah. The boss, take your time, enjoy the scenery. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> it's a boss sabbatical game. <laughs> yes. Jeez. <laughs> oh. uh, I've got uh, a few more bosses that I want to talk about, uh, and some bosses that I want to... Uh, throw in the trash as well, um, but let's let's keep with uh, some positive examples, uh, or just you know I'm gonna start with a weird example. Okay, um, so there's been a lot of Final Fantasy games, and one of the more like left field ones are the uh, Final Fantasy Legend games. These were on the original Game Boy, and now the for the first game, uh, it, you know it's a JRPG. Take a guess what the final boss is. Dragon. No. It's hard to say. I can, uh, I'm not what, gonna be able to... What's what's the like trope of you f fight through this JRPG and what do you fight at the end? The the friend you made all along who had creepy you remarks. Fight God. That... You fight God exactly, Alex. You got it dead on. <laughs> uh, you yeah. You fight the the end boss is the creator, and you encounter the creator actually throughout the game as this just like tuxedo top hat wearing NPC that gives you hints. Oh, He's the hint no. system throughout the game. Wow. And then you get to the end and he reveals himself as the creator. And his entire like ethos has been he was testing humans by like unleashing this atrocity uh, in this tower that was making like life hell for everybody. He's like, can humanity overcome this thing? And he's like, well, you did. Congratulations. I'll give you whatever wish you want. You're so awesome. And the party's like, fuck you, man. <laughs> you basically just, like, killed a ton of people to try and prove a point? Nah, we're gonna kill you. And he's like, 
well, I'm the creator, I can do whatever the fuck I want. Try me. Uh, and in keeping with that theme, the first chunk of the boss fight, the creator doesn't actually do anything. You are wailing on it, and it's just standing there. Hmm. You know, kind of, like, going along with the theme of testing you. And as the fight goes on, it eventually adds more and more uh, powerful attacks to its arsenal, and it ends up if you want to fight it traditionally, it ends up being a fairly difficult boss fight. But, this was a Japanese RPG for the Game Boy. So you know that there's a way to cheese this shit. Yeah. And that is from... There's an item in the game that insta-kills an enemy if your power is greater than their defense. So, works on... It's a great tool for clearing out random encounters, but useless against most bosses, right? They did not use the right equality sign. They use power. They said, okay, power greater than defense. It was reversed. It was power less than defense. Wow. So you can take this item and insta-kill the final boss with it. No way. And that item is a chainsaw. A chainsaw. So at the final finale of Final Fantasy Legend, most players that beat it beat it by chainsawing God to death. Wow. <laughs> Which is one of the most metal things I've ever said about a video game. Oh my god. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, like, it's an interesting boss design, like, normally. Like, it's fairly predictable, you know, progressing power throw, but, you know, the initial, you know, pacifism stage of the boss is really interesting from a design point of view. But, on the other hand, chainsaw. <laughs> so, yeah. really, really cool thing there. Um, you know what? I I want to dunk on some bosses. I want to say that some bosses are bad, because that's that's where the controversy is at. That's where the hits come, right? Uh, so, I've got four bosses that are so I would put on my like worst bosses I've ever played against uh, list. Uh, the first one is actually from Dark Souls, and... I've clearly shown that I love the bosses in Dark Souls, but this boss is terrible because it's the bed of chaos. <laughs> now, the bed of chaos. Remember what I said about how animations in Dark Souls they take a while, and it's really important to place them correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that also applies to the movement in Dark Souls. You have a stamina bar, uh, and managing that is very very important. You need to be very deliberate when you use your rolls, when you use your run, and whatnot. And the uh, controls for moving around, like, they can be a bit stiff and clunky. So what if you made a boss that's all platforming? All that's right. right. The Bed of Chaos is this gigantic, crazy tree-looking thing where the only way to be is you have to run off to one side where the floor constantly collapsing and it slamming down vines at you to kill, to hit it a few times on the left side and then do it again on the right side. And then you need to run up the center of it, again, while dodging all these vines that can knock you into the void at any moment, make a pretty finicky jump, and eventually you can kill the bed of chaos, which is just like a tiny bug creature. That's been controlling this gigantic tree. It is a terrible boss because the controls of the game are just not conducive to what you need to do. So it ends up being an exercise in frustration because you know exactly what you need to do upon like a little bit of exploring around the boss arena, but being able to do it is just a lesson in frustration. Yeah, I mean, a game like Dark Souls with slow animations and and it's it's meant to be slow and methodical, which that's a control scheme that's not what you want for platforming at all. Yeah. So that's terrible. And the the other three bosses I think are some of the worst bosses are all from Final Fantasy X, and they all come Final Fantasy X blowing the fuck out. <laughs> oh my god, I could I could talk for another two hours about how much I do not like that game. But we'll let's start with these three bosses, which. I should point out are, you fight one, then you fight a, another boss uh, a little bit later that's actually well designed, and then the next two bosses are the other two bosses on this list. So they're all like kind of in one section of the game, and it's terrifying. Okay, 
The first one is Seymour Flux. Anybody who's played Final Fantasy X knows that this boss is a motherfucker. He's one of the toughest bosses in JRPGs, really, because he just, like, he takes an awkward battle system and exploits the hell out of it. One of the easiest th ways to deal with bosses in Final Fantasy X is to use summons. Summons are extremely powerful because they're not just, like, you summon and then it does some damage and then that's one person's turn. You summon your Aeon, it comes into the fight, and you control it the entire time. So you basically get a free character to be dealing damage with and taking damage. Uh, Seymour is, uh, after one attack from these summons, instantly snaps his fingers and sends it away. Insta-kills it. So you cannot rely on summon spams as much as you could in other bosses. Uh, so, okay, that's fine. That, you know, makes you fight on more fair terms, right? That would be the case if Seymour was remotely fair. He's got two parts to him, the main part and this little fucker that uh, is with him, who you can kill, but will be instantly revived by absorbing some of Seymour, main Seymour's health. So you can't truly get rid of the additional enemy in, the, in this fight. Uh, that seems, seems kind of annoying. Yeah. Um, Seymour is extremely fast, so he'll get a lot of actions. Uh, so you can't rely on slow damage dealers like Oron in your party to get through. You need to be on your shit with faster characters, which will, if you're not uh, playing with your other characters, they might be underleveled or something. Because when you, as soon as you get Oron, like he's a badass and you want to use him all the time. So you can't really rely on him in this fight. Uh, and Seymour just like puts out a few things that you can't really deal with. So because he's two parts, he will do an attack that does inflict zombie, which you can cure. Inflict zombie? Zombies, zombie is, you know, it's the undead status, which in a lot of JRPGs means that instead of uh, whenever you would be healed, you would take damage instead. He will follow that up with full life, which will, you know, that's a one-two combo that will insta-kill one of your characters. And it comes out so fast that you usually don't have time to cure the zombie from one of your party members. So already you have to be spending turns reviving party members that get insta-killed by this, uh, which slows you down. Uh, Seymour also has an insanely powerful full party attack, and you only have three members in your party, I should add. And as well as the fight goes on, he starts a countdown to a move that will probably wipe your entire party, and there's not too much you can do against it. It's a lesson in, un like, very difficult to prevent things. And it just makes it frustrating more than challenging. Because uh, in a lot of J JRPGs, when you get to a certain point, the game opens up to where you have enough options to deal with uh, any bullshit that comes your way. Uh, in Final Fantasy X, you, this, you really don't have that at this point unless you have a strategy guide to know like exactly what enemies have what drops to get specific things to, for example, give one of your pieces of armor zombie-proof or something like that. Uh, the next boss is actually a really good boss design, just done so piss-poorly that it ends up being bad. Uh, it's the Spectral Keeper, who is this weird, like, scythe wasp. Scythe wasp he sounds looks, awesome. Yeah, he looks kind of cool. Uh, but this boss fight, um, Final Fantasy X is a turn... Yo. It's a, it's a Scyther and a Beedrill. It's, it kind of is, except and it's red. So it's like a Scyther Caesar Beedrill. Uh, Final Fantasy X's combat system is entirely turn-based. It's not like the active time battle of uh, the, some of the other Final Fantasy games, where you know each character will go and do their actions, and you see them, who's going to act in this big timeline. So you always have perfect information on... Uh, what's coming, like, who's attacking when. So uh, it's actually, like, a good combat system uh, in most cases. In this fight, you your party is split up onto these six circles around this stupid wasp thing. And that's, like, the gimmick of the fight. You can switch where your characters are standing. That'll take up one of their turns. And this boss will counter every hit with a sweeping claw attack that attacks the three circles in front of it. 
So you have to constantly be managing where your characters are and when you're attacking, picking things very deliberately to fight this boss. Now, this would be a pretty good idea for a boss, but the problem is that this counterattack, the animation takes kind of a long time, and it does so much damage that, like, you can't just kind of wail on it a few times and heal up in between, which I suppose is good, You can't, so you can't just ignore what the boss is trying to do. But what this boss loves to do is use a move called Berserk Tail, which berserks one of your party members, so that they will always attack and have no option to move. This is bad enough and is interesting enough, but again, the animation for this move takes a while because the camera zoomed out and the berserk status effect is just the character kind of glowing red. It's kind of hard to see. So what they do is that when it uses berserk, it slowly zooms in on the character that it hit afterwards. So e each time this stupid wasp attacks, it can take like 10 seconds for it to attack and for you to finally get back to your turn. Everything is just taking forever in this boss fight where you already have to deliberately move all your characters around and pick carefully when, when you attack. It ends up being a really long boss fight that's drawn out for no good reason. And also, this stupid wasp uh, lays mines on some of the uh, circles, which will explode and insta-kill you. So again, you have to be managing where you are. So, good concepts, but just execute so poorly. Now, the last boss fight, that's actually right after well, right after a really melodramatic cutscene, then you fight this next boss, is Unalesca, who is a three-part boss with tons of health. All her animations take way too long. She counters everything. But that's not the worst part. The worst part is her final form, which casts a spell called Mega Death. Because regular death is not good enough. Mega Death insta-kills your entire party. What? What? Now, here's the trick, is that you can avoid Megadeth by your characters being zombified. And uh. Unaleska will do a move called Hellbiter, which does an amount of damage and zombifies all your party members. But remember, when you're zombified, you can't heal. You'll take damage instead. So, it becomes this awful game of, mi of having to manage uh, your health of your characters which is constantly getting drained by all these counterattacks and just chipped away. And you need at least some members of your party zombified whenever Unaleska casts Mega Death. So you can't just cure it all the time, heal up, and you don't have a reliable way of inflicting zombie on your own characters unless you've been doing something really crazy with the Sphere Grid. So it's just this awful, awful managing of all these different things that it's just not fun and i'd like to point out one of the reasons why unaleska and seymour are so bad is because final fantasy 10 has fairly long cutscenes that are not skippable oh no so you know the 12 or so attempts that it took me to beat seymour i had to watch like a four minute cutscene before every single goddamn one oh. And, ah, oh, it's so fucking bad. <laughs> so yeah, that, that trifecta of boss fights, like, what little that I actually liked about Final Fantasy X, that sequence turned me off so badly. I didn't even finish that game. <laughs> wow. Uh, so yeah, those are some bad boss fights. And it's rough. Yeah, and, like, I think that a lot of JRPG bosses, like could be a lot better. A lot of them, like, aren't great, in my opinion. Um, but I, I do have a couple here that are, like, examples that I think are amazing. Um, one of which is uh, from Etrian Odyssey 5. Uh, I will talk about the Etrian Odyssey series on a later episode because I think it is one of the most brilliant RPG series ever created, but uh, it's the, the, you know, a, it's a classic enemy. A zombie dragon. Of course. Uh, this is one of the post-game bosses. <laughs> uh, and the post-game in Etrian Odyssey games is hellishly difficult. Like, the main game is really difficult. The post-game is maddeningly so. Uh, but the zombie dragon uh, is 
one of the most interesting boss fights uh, that I've ever played. Um, in part because of uh, the lead up, uh, which is a. It's all about that lead up. It's all about that lead up. Because when you go to the area that the zombie dragon's in, it will shoot out this dark mist that will permeate the field. And Etrian Odyssey is a first person dungeon crawler, so you're walking, you know, one tile at a time. Uh, and whenever you encounter a battle with this dark mist out, your party will start blinded. And blind in Etrian Odyssey means you fucking miss everything. Oh. Basically, like, status effects are, like, debilitating in this game. Ooh. So, as well, um, there's this concept of FOEs, which are... Uh, Foes? Yes. It, it stands for something. I'll get to that in a later episode, because what it stands for is hilarious. Uh, but these are basically, like, more powerful than random encounter enemies that are roaming the map. When this dark mist is out, you cannot see where these char- where these enemies are on the map. So you will get ambushed by these things. And because this is the post-game, and these are actually earlier enemies, they're not actually that tough to take out. But they have a really quick respawn time. And because you can't see them, you can just get swamped by them. Kind of like in Hell, where they just wear you down. And Etrian Odyssey has a, you know, a limited inventory space. You don't act, have a ton of restoratives on you unless you stock yourself up with them. And uh, restoratives for restoring your uh, magic points are actually fairly hard to come by. So, like, that that sort of wearing you down is super effective at making your party worse. Uh, when you finally get to the zombie dragon, if you start the fight with him uh, while the dark mist is out, you know, your characters will be blinded, so you, so you want to not do that. But when you don't do that, the first thing he does is do an attack, which attempts to blind your party. Oh, man. Uh, so you can't you can't escape the blindness. Um, and the zombie dragon has it sounds a t- like it sounds like like a metal song. You can't escape the blindness. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but the zombie dragon is all about just like eff- effects that affect everything, including itself. What? So it will do a move called Poison Rain, which attempts to poison everything on the field, including itself. Uh, as well as curse, cursing the entire field, including itself. And what Curse does is that you take back the damage that you do. It's incredibly annoying for the player character, because usually you're dealing a lot more damage uh, than the enemy's doing, for example, so you can easily one-shot yourself with it. But the trick is, is that if the zombie dragon has Poison or Curse, and takes Poison or Curse damage it'll instantly heal itself for more than that damage ticks. So if it has these status effects, it is actually benefiting from it, while it, whereas you are not. So you need to be inflicting other status effects or making use of uh, other debilitating moves to make sure it can't use these rain attacks to like really just mess everything up. The other thing that it does is that it will occasionally spit out this mist that the next time any fire attack happens, it'll do massive fire damage to everything on the field, including itself. So you have so it's explosive gas. Yes, yeah. and it's also it's it's actually weak to fire, so you want to be using that constantly. But if you are using it constantly, your party could be exploded just as easily as it can. So this boss fight is really is really tricky to navigate all these different things, whereas also doing all these other. Uh, fil- fairly annoying attacks. But the the piece de resistance of this boss fight is that each boss in Etrian Aussie has a drop that you'll get pretty much 100% of the time for beating it, and a secret drop that you get for defeating it under certain circumstances. For the zombie dragon, it has to die from the, f- from, uh, the fire explosion that happens from its dark mist attack being exploded. That's cool. So you so to get this, you need to like really like cleverly manage things until it gets fairly low in health and let it like blow itself up. Basically, it's an amazing feeling to pull off because it because again like it's has all these attacks that affect everything. To have it you know basically destroy itself is a really unique thing uh, that I think is like really really awesome. Yeah, sounds like a cool one. <laughs> yeah. I haven't played any Etrian Odyssey myself. Uh, it's, um... 
<laughs> the early games are pretty impenetrable. The later games are much, much better designed. But uh, that's that's a topic for another day. I've got uh, three more bosses I want to talk about. Uh, one being uh, Gafgarian from Final Fantasy Tactics. Uh, now, strategy RPGs are another genre that the boss fights can be really hit or miss. Um, again, generally because strategy RPGs, you have a lot of options at your disposal. So when you go into a fight, you could be bringing like, just the wrong stuff for any particular encounter. Or you could be bring exactly the right stuff and it's not a challenge. Uh, Gafgarian, uh, you fight him three times and each time is a really unique encounter. Uh, the first time you fight him, he betrays your party. And you just spent like two missions where he's got this attack that... It's a signature attack which drains health from the enemy. Now, in a lot of games, uh, drain attacks usually don't do that much damage and maybe drain for a portion of the damage you deal. In Final Fantasy Tactics, this attack gives him the full HP back and is more powerful than his standard attack. So wow. he's like, he establishes himself in your party as this guy's a badass who can like carry me through these encounters. And then he betrays you. And then uh. you have to fucking fight him. As well as protect a princess who's on a bridge. And you have to fight Gafgarian. And this other guy that's helping you is on the other side. And it's this, like, really, like, almost cinematic in a strategy RPG, if you can believe it, kind of encounter. Uh, though that can be cheesed if you completely unequip him before the battle starts. Ah, yes. <laughs> the, listen. <laughs> if, if a... If a role-playing game is immune to cheese, I don't think it's a true role-playing game. <laughs> um, the second time you fight Gafgarian is basically it's a it's a it's a trap where you hear that that princess from earlier is going to be executed. You go to the execution site and yeah, it's a trap. You have to fight Gafgarian at his full strength. You can't unequip him this time because he's already an enemy. Uh, and this is the first battle in which you are fairly outnumbered. In most battles, you're fighting on even terms in Final Fantasy Tactics. In this one, the enemy has three more uh, characters than you do. So, based on everything's positioning in the level, it's, it's like one of the big difficulty spikes in that game. And the music that plays in that level, uh, Antiparetic, is a fantastic song. And it's the first time it plays in that game. So, like, you know, hey, these stakes are fucking raised. Uh, so that's a really tough boss fight where you have to fight against overwhelming numbers for the first time. And the last boss fight is the most interesting where you're sneaking into a castle. Your main character is on the other side of the gate and who's waiting there for you but Gafgarian. So you have to solo fight him. Wow. And remember, he has an HP drain move. So oh. trying to solo fight him is, an ex is mostly an exercise in futility. But there's a few different things that you can do to uh, get rid of this. Because on the other side of the gate is the rest of your party fighting a bunch of other enemies. So if you have attacks that have a certain amount of range that aren't bow attacks because you can't shoot through a gate, uh, you can like try and maneuver Gafgarian close to the gate and then... Come like, on, gate's hit, got holes. And then hit him with magic. Um, or if you have a, uh, a lancer, you can use the jump move to like jump over the fucking gate and smack down on him before returning to where you are originally. But the trickiest thing, though, is that earlier, when you first arrive at that castle, you arrive as uh, friendly friendly people, and it shows that gate, and it shows a person walking up to a switch on the gate, pulling the switch, and the gate opens. Now, there's nothing else in the game up to that point that's been interactable in that way, but... On this stage, there is. So if you move your main character to that gate, they will open the gate, and then the rest of your party can flood in and fuck this guy up. And it's oh, that's, so satisfying that's, that's cool. to, to discover that. Because it foreshadows it, but it doesn't tell you explicitly, do this to get through this encounter. So that's a, that's a three-pack of really interesting fights against this enemy. Uh now, the next two bosses I'm going to talk about are both from Final Fantasy XII, uh, and one of them is my favorite boss in any video game, so I, I'm going to save that one for last. But um, a great boss, boss is a, 
I'm going to butcher this pronunciation, uh, is a Kuchlane, who is this, like, large, kind of like, looks kind of like a s sea creature-ish, humanoid-ish, almost kind of thing, that you fight in the sewers. It's an optional boss. It's one of um, the Eidolons in that game, which are basically the summons. And it comes into battle with four little minions that it controls. And whenever you fight any of these optional summons, the battlefield has some kind of effect that changes things. For Kuchelain, it's a constant HP uh, lowering effect. So your HP is constantly draining throughout this entire battle. And what does Kuchelain's specialty? Inflicting poison, which does the same thing, and inflicting sap, which does the same thing even faster. So he's, hmm. he's constantly throwing out these status effects that are going to be draining your health at such a rapid rate that it can uh, outpace your healing in a very different way than a lot of boss fights can outpace your healing, where they're just throwing out singular attacks that do this. Uh, on top of that, Kuchelain has disable moves that will make your party unable to act or unable to move. Uh, so this makes it so that, you know, the fight's just going to take longer while your HP is going down. So it's a really smartly designed fight to make take advantage of this, you know, gimmick that they're trying to throw at you. Now, that all is pretty, like, cool in its own way, but Kuchelain's final dick move is a move called Invert, which switches your HP and your, and your MP. Uh-oh. Hmm. Now, as you can imagine, you have a lot less MP than you do HP, and your HP is constantly draining, and you're using your MP to fight this boss, probably. So... He can switch that on you, and so you might, you probably won't even have enough time to fix this horrible thing that happened to you before your HP just drains down to zero and your and one of your characters dies. So wow. it's it's a really cool gimmick that they uh, that they use to its full effect in that in that boss fight. Uh, and my favorite boss fight in any video game is the Mandragoras. These fucking assholes. There are five vegetables huh. that you fight in the middle of the game in this gigantic circular room with kind of nothing in it. And all these dumbass vegetables are throwing out such a variety of attacks at your party, running around constantly, and they're also fairly small, so it's a bit hard to keep track of which one goes where. So it can be difficult to focus any one of them down. Some of them will heal the other ones. Some of them will throw status elements and elemental effects. It's a complete. It's the most chaotic fight I've ever had in any video game, and it's so much fun to do because you're just flying at the seat of your pants the entire time. And flying at the seat of your pants is the feeling that I want the most out of any kind of JRPG battle, where you feel like you're barely keeping up with what's happening. The Persona games have a big problem where you have access to abilities that fully heal characters. Uh, so you're a lot of the times you're just not in any true danger. So like that series doesn't have a lot of bosses where that can fall under this category. But in games where healing is limited or when there's so many enemies that they have more actions than you do, like mm -hmm. that can make a really, really good uh, boss encounter in a JRPG. So uh, that's something that, you know, a, another takeaway for a good boss design in any kind of JRPG or strategy RPG in particular is uh, making it so that the enemy has more action economy than you do. That sounds dope. Nice. So I went on a bit of a rant at the end there, but uh, I think my list was longer than your guys's. It was uh, the, the final boss of this episode. <laughs> uh, we had to defeat it to move forward. <laughs> yes. The boss must be defeated. Um, so yeah, I think we, we covered a lot of uh, covered a lot of ground, a lot of bosses, a lot of good discussion about like some of the things. And so you know, I think we have some answers now to some questions we asked at the beginning of the episode. What makes a good boss fight? You know? A good difficulty that challenges you without being, without feeling unfair. Um, great lead up. Mm -hmm. uh, getting a good atmosphere uh, for 
in preparation for the boss fight, you know, makes a diff big difference to how memorable it is. Boss fights with really interesting and unique gameplay that doesn't appear elsewhere in the game. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, interesting movement options mm -hmm. in the boss arena. Uh, Rec recurring bosses uh, that and bosses that are really built up by the story. Another great one. And if you're able to pull off a twist boss really well, that can work spectacularly as well. And bosses that don't give you unrealistic expectations or uh, stressful deadlines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think that'll, that'll do it for this episode. If you'd like to leave us a performance review, you can reach out to us at angrysunzone at outlook.com. Uh, I'd love to hear some of your favorite bosses and what makes them so great. This concludes your employment onboarding process. Be sure to register with payroll, or else you won't get paid. <laughs> Wait, you're getting paid?